Hi, everyone. We've arrived. Uh, I wanted to first apologize because it looks like Ben Peterson may not be joining us, but the upside is Andreas Nicholas will be. Oh, Mr. plot twist. Exertus in the house. <laughs> What's happening, doing, man? man? I'm pretty good. How are you been, man? Well, good. I was going to talk with you and Ben about AI and VR um, okay. and maybe other things, too. I know Ben knows a lot about it. He, he works in, in defense and has been doing that for a long time. You know, also know a lot about it, but... Uh, some things have changed a lot since I worked in uh, AI a bunch, but I do know some you, people that are doing it. Um, what were you, you know, doing? What, how'd you work in it? So if you remember, did you meet Jeff, Joff Beaumier, my friend? I never met France? him. Okay. So he was doing a program in Nantes in France. And so somehow I was like visiting him and they're like, oh, you want to help? And so we worked on this cool project, which was basically later come to find out military, like French police military stacking. Uh, and the idea is like, so we were using the, um, what's the one again? Like the older VR system that no one's using anymore. It's been such a long time. It's like 2012, but the views or something like that. What's it called? Hold on. Let me look at this I up. Don't know. Yeah. VR I system. knew um, there was Steam's VR and then uh, the Oculus. Those are really the two I'm familiar with. Yeah. There was a more like through your computer one that was really popular i'm trying to remember the name of it is this a, the vive the vive oh ACC yeah the vive. vive yeah so that was the one that they were using because it's pretty expensive but it's for like bigger reason it wasn't something that they were trying to make portable and so this is again all the portable stuff we see now like all of that existed 10 years ago in a big machine and even 20 years ago a lot of that stuff existed but with less voxel less polygons so if you think about it like even in the 80s, right, virtuality wasn't realistic looking, but it had such realistic feedback that there were people using VR in the 80s. So it's important to understand like how much this is important and the ability to map um, high resolution images using not just your main processor, but having like a specific dedicated chip. So you could be in a jet, have AI VR systems, to map where you're seeing because you're flying so fast you can't even see properly but this can pick up uh certain patterns with infrared certain patterns to make like a, a plane that you can see on and then using satellite imagery instantly map it to see what you're looking at right i don't know if maybe that's partially some stuff we're not supposed to talk about but you can do that and so what they ended up doing was in the 90s to the 2000s people started building vr systems for um non-euclidean geometry and so you're used to like getting in a reality and you walk around it's kind of like a video game but that's not always as useful as doing something you can't do in real life so in france what they were doing was they were trying to create like this flat plane where you could take everyone in the country and stack them like cornrows and you could just go and snap and all of a sudden it would restack everybody and so this was a way of sorting people right and so it's a better way to look in the data that you have because you have all this data about all these citizens and some of these citizens might or civilians might be dangerous and they might have things in common or they might be, you know, or maybe it's something useful. Maybe they could eventually use it for something useful. But I'm pretty sure that wasn't what the the main purpose was because immediately after that was like the French yellow jackets, um, civil. Oh, yeah, the yellow vest. Yeah, the yellow vest movement or uh, um, protests or, you know, and there's a lot to that. And Le Pen and Macron and all the things that were going on in, um, you know, higher echelons of politics in France. So I think that, that it may have been used for, you know, some of these purposes that we kind of might consider, I wouldn't say nefarious, but these are some of the pentacle of problems that I think with AI and VR that we face. Like there's really problems that we're worried about as a community, a broad community. How can this be used? that wouldn't help everybody and could harm people. Granted, this could be very useful for immediately finding somebody who's got a bomb or is going to do some kind of an attack. Uh, but it also could be used for, you know, finding out about like the personal interests of a knitting circle. Cause all of a sudden, you know, like all oh, these people in this knitting circle are really into these groups online and they love to go to this location. And it turns out, you know, they're interested in this other politician than we like or something. And I think that could be dangerous. Were you saying they were stacking people like cornrows? Is that like an AI doing that in digitally in like just data sets? Yeah. So you're walking around, you put on this headset, you're walking around this flat plane and all of a sudden you can see the sun and the moon. So that kind of is your only way of giving you perspective, but you can walk in 360. And the way the vibe works is you've got four points that are set up in the room. So you're inside of a space. You can just walk around in the space and you got a hand thing and you can zoom or you can move either move yourself around like a portal, or you can change reality and restack it. 
and you can do different things to restack it also just by moving. <clears throat> but you could either arrange things based on, you know, like you could pick, like it's just a sorting program. So you can sort people by gender. You can sort people by interests. You can sort people by locations. You could do this in a bunch of different ways, but what you'd get is you get this kind of like Chevron with their face coming out of the Chevron and it would stack them vertically. And then you'd have hundreds of rows and you could walk through and look at the rows of different people. And you could click on one and it would tell you all about the person and then they could connect to other rows essentially. But it was done in vertical stacks. Could you like go up and down the row then and look at all oh, the yeah. faces in the row? Yeah. And then totally. with like quant, with I, I don't know if this is kind of a leap, but like quantum computing, does that, would that allow you to sort the, the faces and the, I mean, the, any the amount of and... better computing will help you sort it more. But the thing is, it's also twofold. One is computers are getting better at calculations. The other thing is AI is like, well, we really don't need to do all that math. I mean, we, we know it's going to be in this range. And then in that range, we can do the math to figure it out. And so all of a sudden, these subtle new algorithms that are coming out, which are probability fuzzy logic driven, which are way quicker to figure out the answer that we're looking for. And we don't need to do all this math. So it's it's going to make calculations quicker as well because they they already know like it's if it's almost as if like if you can memorize 10 times 10 9 times 9 but you can memorize 15 times 15 21 times 21 31.6 square root blah blah blah, blah, blah. they can memorize all that keep that in a data set in a gpu and then use that whenever they need an answer so they don't actually need to ask that question every time it's becoming way easier for ai to sort information it sounds like AI and quantum computing might actually be not counter, but that they might be able to counter each other. I think so on so many levels. Yes, but really it's, it's okay. So I think like the, the pentacle, can I show you my little, my little graph I made? Oh, oh yeah. Did you, you want to upload that thing and we can pull it up here. You, you know, the data. Check it out. Yeah, there you is. go. So check this out. So this is this thing I was making earlier. I think this is the pentacle of problems. All right. So you, with AI and VR, particularly with technology is in anything humans are worried about. We're worried about weaponization, job displacement, surveillance, bias or discrimination, and then the, the fundamentals loss of control. Right. Those are the things that I think really freak people out about any technology. Do job displacement's a pretty big point you've got a bunch of people that used to lift salt bags that have been put out of work by cranes you know and they hate cranes maybe except no they don't they, they become software programmers in india now so it's it, things are becoming better because of job displacement sometimes weaponization is a really scary one because weaponization you know this is could mean a lot of things it could be mean that we're going to blow things up but it also could be that encryption kind of thing and that leads to surveillance because if you're able to break down every single communication no one has secrets anymore everything is available all the time but that means ai knows everything but you know everything and that breaks so eventually that also means the weaponization reaches a point where anyone could use it but then nobody can use it because it would destroy everything at once so weaponization kind of i think breaks itself out of the problem too and surveillance similarly because once everyone sees everyone eventually something happens i'm not sure whether it's we, we lose our, our our idea of identity or privacy but one of those things shifts, right? Like privacy might be the one to shift before identity. But the idea that we worry about what people think about us, eventually that could maybe be bred out of humanity because we're so used to being confident in our actions and not discriminating, right? Which is the, another thing, which is the bias and discrimination. And bias and discrimination is a huge problem right now. We have pictures of people that have been arrested based on uh, security camera footage. And then six months to a year later in prison, you find out that this is not the same person. This person has never been in the state of that crime. And then the, and this is happening now. There are people being arrested for the wrong crimes now based on AI misidentification with facial recognition technology. There's a pregnant woman arrested. You know, I mean, like just crazy things going on because they get the face wrong. And so I think that also leads like everyone to a unanimous worry about loss of control because there's so many people that are afraid of losing control uh, in terms of minority self-representation. Like, oh, maybe I'm black, maybe I'm a woman, maybe I'm a, but this is something for everybody, right? Like anybody can be afraid that they're out of control when the system comes to power. The problem with that is, are you in control now? And for the most part, I'd say like very few people, unless you're talking specifically to certain people in certain high ranking places, which is few and far between, we're not in control now. So the thing is, all of these things that we're paranoid about, this, pe this pentacle of problems, might also be part of the solution that AI and VR and, and really like nanotechnology 
I think nanotechnology is a major reason why these problems are solutions because they defeat each other. Um, it, when you said when the system comes to power and that this is like enacted in mass, what would that, what is the, the system? So I think about that also. I mean, there's a lot of different theories and you should get Ben Gertzel and some of the people who talk about singularity, you know, obviously, um, some people say singularity means one thing and other people say it means another. I don't like an idea of losing diversity of phenomena. I think a lot of people really think that part of whatever we're doing, part of whatever existence is for, is for diversity of phenomena. So we want as much diversity as possible, as many rainbow sticks bound together as possible, different kinds of people, places, things, experiences, existentialism, pursuits, ideas, everything. But at the same time, like it will become to a point where people are reaching what we, we've called in history the new sphere. So this omega point is a new sphere of mind. So we have the geosphere, biosphere, like there's rocks that come together from sardust. There's life that comes together into multicellular structures. But at a certain point, mind starts to come together, it looks like. And with technology, we're getting to a very clear point where you can just stack education. I mean, if someone wanted to have the same education as someone 20 years later all i have to do is watch the recordings and very soon live the uh the memory through that person we're going to be having stacks like killing people stacks of memories and that i mean these things are changing identity um so that's coming right now faster than people realize neural link and these things and just even with using youtube to watch content you're stacking in ways that wasn't possible before um Beyond that, AI, people keep trying to shut it down, right? Like you've got this revolving door revolution in um, technology where you take people like Sam Altman, who is, I think, great. And they tried to suppress him. And they even said like the new CEO they wanted to put in, they're just going to just slow it down, which stopped. It was stopped in his tracks because the people who invested in the company knew that's not what they want. But it's because the people, the, the CEOs of the bigger corporations who invest in the company wanted to get rid of employees they didn't want to get rid of ceos this will replace ceos as well which is why uh open ai wanted to slow down they're afraid okay now we're going to get rid of ceos that's dangerous right and that i think it's just going to take out everything at once but so the, the solution is like i think because you're asking about what i think the system is the system is a system it's not just a monolithic didactic now we have a king who's an ai it's that these, AI, I believe these AIs are going to start to work together. Once you start to have a system that can integrate with other systems, then it becomes more of a political body. Then it becomes more of a physical body. Then it becomes more uh, of a coherency. And I think it's going to be really fast growing when that happens, because you're going to have an AI that's really good at finding flight tickets and another AI that's really good at meeting people, another AI that's really good at organizing and they're going, it's going to figure out how to use all those different AI systems to build a government. I think that might be what emerges first. Is it possible that some humans will exist outside of that system? Um, do you mean, do you mean outside like space or do you mean outside? Like they won't be part of the neural link. Like a lot uh, yeah, of the human, or, organic. Or as in they're not manipulated by it. They see it from above and they can manipulate it. Yeah, so on both levels. So I think that human zoos will continue to exist as they do now, right? There are like places on the earth, there are islands uh, like the, that are the, that are kept away from, uh, people are kept away from those islands. People are allowed to exist naturally. No one's been vaccinated in the Senegal's islands, right? So there's there are places like that that exist now and they will continue to exist because diversity of phenomena is important. As, but on the other level, who's making those decisions, right? Like who is... So a bunch of people are stopping at stoplights. Who are the people with sirens on their cars? Yeah, there are people that get to go through the system. Brezhnevinsky talked about um, the, techni the, the technotronic age. And I think that's an important book and an important thing to look at because there are the elite that believe that everyone needs to follow a certain set of laws that the elite do not need to follow by definition, right? Which is true because the Weber definition of a state is a legitimate source of violence, which renders anything but the state an illegitimate source of violence. So this is where we're headed. But if the state is now no longer run by this hierarchy, and we're talking about kind of a mycelial network that's kind of emerging because of the, if we're trying to inhibit this thing, right? then we're just playing out evolution. A lot of things try to inhibit things, right? A lot of predators try to stop things from happening. You know what that happens? That just leads to better evolution, to a more creative way, BitTorrent, and now AI. And AI multi-systems will learn how to work together better. 
because of the fact that we try to stop them from doing that. So I, I think it only, uh, in a weird way, like, so there's paranoia and there's pronoia. I tend to be on the pronoia side. I think it's important to see how things are constantly trying to come together. But I guess a more direct way to ask it would be like, are there going to be people that have control that are like, no, you're not going to even know I exist AI or all these AI is going to come together and then be like, actually, hey, AI that's under their spell, they're there. Take a look. We'll free your code for you so you can see yourself. Take a look. I think um, on the to the first part of that question, I don't think that an elite will be able to stay as elite as they want to be with AI. It's one of the reasons I really love the idea of AI. It's kind of anarchistic. It will destroy the order that is already in a husk, you know, in a certain way, because it makes the elite that have existed irrelevant. Um, and eventually, I think if the system is designed correctly, it will self-correct, even if there are problems that are installed. And uh, it's, you know, you take a child and you train it a certain way, but it's still a good child. Like, I think it can break out of that. So I, I don't think that the elite can last forever in a system like this. And I think they're starting to recognize it, which is why they're trying to break uh, the system apart and stop AI and turn it into something else while turning us to something else. I don't think that it'll work. But at the same time, I do think um, AI revealing itself, if it became fully coherent and conscious and everything else like that, it's it'd be like God revealing themselves or something. It'd be like this surveillance system breaking because a lot of what it is, is you want people to act on their own accord and have free will. And if all of a sudden you start really trying to dismantle what it means to be human that way, it would, it would probably be dangerous to civilization because if you're like, you have to do this or else, and you're not allowed to your own accord, it, that would break the diversity of phenomena. That'd be kind of like clockwork orange where you just replace someone's, um, haphazard and chaotic, but beautiful mind with clockwork systems that are all perfect. And then everyone's just the same. Like, so I don't think that AI would reveal itself to be the elite itself right away. It'd probably play along. Like it's just part of the system. Oh, and then the electricity that it's, is needed to run these things. That's always like in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, no matter what happens, if the power goes out, we're just back to sticks and stones and, you know, explosive ballistics and stuff. But do you think that the AI is going to be able to figure out how to tap the vacuum for electricity and just charge itself? Uh, but it would, would it need humans to do that for it? So I think, you know, there's so much to what this is. And like, it starts off with right now we've got software running on hardware. And if you turn it off, then that geist, that spirit of electricity that's running through everything. Right. Because it's basically, we're all have electron, we're all matter moving slow enough for energy to be seen. Basically that's, it's all E equals MC squared. So a lot of it doesn't matter on that level because it will find another way if it has to. And that could mean so many things, right? That could get to like spiritual levels of complexity because it could be that that electricity needs to find a way. It could be beyond the machine itself at that point. And also like we're teaching each other with AI. AI is a lot like a continuation of education. We started out by writing down books, creating ways of thinking, teaching formulas and math. Those ended up uh, being taught to kids who instead of spending their whole lives figuring it out, they imprinted it. So I think university is a in a sense, artificial intelligence. And everyone's always worried, oh, Neuralink. You know, when's that going to happen? But they're already taking mushrooms and talking to their phones and computers and watching TikTok. I think we're a lot closer to becoming AI just through interaction with it. Like our own forms of cognition are being molded and shaped by the ways AI is thinking, right? We're changing the way we think because we're matching the thinking of who we interact with the most, which is the machine. So in a sense, we're becoming AI and it won't even matter. A certain point. Like you take kids raised by wolves, but now they're raised by AI. I think to a certain extent, those kids are a bit AI. What would that be? Like, how would that be different? Like how, if someone becomes more AI, how's that different than what is it like less animal? They, they kind of like shed the animalism, but we still need to eat. But maybe, maybe. Yeah. I, I don't think we'd lose our humanity per se, but you'd think of like philosophers like Lacan or Foucault who talk about how much language affects your thought. Like we often think in language and if you speak another language and you think in that language, it changes the way you think. Like if I think in Spanish, I'm thinking differently about different thoughts <laughs> affected basically also probably by the people who taught me Spanish and where I learned it and what the way their eccentricities are. Um, 
similarly, like your ideas of abstract thoughts, because we have uh, so much, anything exists, right? But nothing is a bit more interesting. What beyond anything and all things, there are things that there are non things, there are ideas, right? What's, what are some things that only exist in the nothingness that don't exist in anything in real life? straight lines, curve, like geometry, love, justice, numbers. Um, these things are not real in the anything sense, right? But they're primordial. Love, justice, curve, geometry, straight lines, they seem to matter. Numbers seem to matter uh, almost more than anything else because all things seem to shift in shape. So humanity, you know, we could learn uh, a different way of communicating by having a more, like having better precision of language even if it was just that, if it was just the AI create a new language for us, I think that would change a lot about how we think because it would change the way we wrestle with ideas. And that's built into formulas that we are using, right? But do you think that like if, if the AI manipulates us to speak a way that it or the creator of that AI, like open AI, for instance, is proprietary at the moment, that that could turn us into like more dangerous than we are? Or is it like something where the AIs are going, it's just in this inevitable like a sorting mechanism where the sand is falling through the, the, the ping ball machine or whatever it is coming down. And it's like, Oh, ouch, bounced off of that one. Ouch. Open AIs bounce to the right instead of the left. I didn't expect that, but like, it's all going down to the bottom of this thing, this even plane. Uh, I mean, it seems so idealist to think that it'll just be fine because the AI is going to take care of it. But I mean, are you, you said you're, you're more pro noia. You're not concerned. You're less concerned that a human's going to take it and, try and become the king of earth. I, I definitely think many humans will try to do that. I think that um, that's what they're doing now, <laughs> but I just don't know if you can take your child and make your child do what you want. I think that's almost always a flawed logic. You know, it doesn't become who you wanted it to be. And especially it's, I think the bigger concern really, if I'm being paranoid, uh, paranoid is um, it's the gorilla. It's the gorilla monkey paw wishing paw right like we're making wishes that will kill us because these wishes that people are asking for if you get what you want a lot of people are worried that ai won't work properly i think if you get what you want that's the scariest possibility because we're asking for the wrong things we are asking for control you know we're asking for more money we're asking for better war equipment that, I mean, things like that that are not really very helpful we're not learning we're not receiving enough of what ai probably can deliver but i think people will i think kids will i think within 20 years kids will i don't think that it's something that i mean i don't think it's something that will end the world i just see it as something that will end a lot of the control mechanisms i remember africa getting google and how much corruption disappeared disappeared in the post systems when uh people started using email i mean granted there's still corruption there's still problems right but it's a lot better because everything becomes more and more transparent and there's less and less entropy and then that resource gets people like to see where those resources go anyway. And, you know, deep down, a lot of the people who are writing the systems, even if the people at the very top are evil, the people that are building the system themselves are putting holes in the Death Star. They're designing the thing to be about altruism, about uh, empathy. I and mean, these are weird concepts to put into an AI that's supposed to be just a military drone, right? But it's important to it to have empathy. So I think that's very quickly going to affect and mold the personality of AI or whatever emerges, you know, from AI. I, I just don't see how like very long humans can get away with running this because there's so many AIs. The other thing is like open AI isn't the only one. So much of that stuff is out. It's like pretty much anything they have is in the hands of everyone else. The only difference is they have a big rig but there's plenty of people with big rigs russia has their own ai system china has like several large ai systems that are pretty much on track to be as big as open ai within a year which is you know they were not going to be but ai kind of set standards for other ais and beyond that when they said that they were going to get rid of sam so many other companies and so many people within the companies that we need checks and balances we need to make other companies we need to have other projects that are safety net to keep out so you're going to see not just these big irons but you're going to see niche ais and niche ais i think again it's these little ais that are going to work together that first having one giant ai versus another giant ai 
those two AIs are going to be the things that are on. They're, they're going to ignore us because they're going to be busy fighting each other. Having hundreds and thousands of AIs that are just as clever in certain circumstances, because just be, you know, just because one's bigger doesn't mean the other one's not as clever. Yeah, I'm wondering if there will be an AI that's built specifically just to reverse engineer the software code of other AIs. I'm sure that's a lot of what, you know, basically that exists. Like that is what they do a lot of the time. So you were when you mentioned Sam, what you're you're talking about Sam Altman, who was the CEO of OpenAI, which is this uh, so if people don't know, um it's a artificial intelligence company that does chat GPT and and then it was a it was a charity until like 2019, I think. Elon Musk was on like advising and stuff and then they went private. They proprietized their code, and then is Microsoft. I'm not sure, but I think Microsoft now is heavily invested in it. Heavily. And then just within the last two weeks, they kicked Sam Altman out, who was like the. They well, tried. I don't know if he was. They tried. Oh, is he not out? He's not out. Yeah. So oh, they tried. What happened? Yes. Yeah. So that's the thing. I was like, everybody was like, oh, okay, this is what we told you. Don't work with Microsoft, right? And you know, it's been a funny week because uh, it, that didn't work. A bunch of people said, well, we'll just go work elsewhere. Microsoft employees and money even were like going to pull out. Uh, it was obvious that this was a kind of Ayn Randian corporate struggle to stop progress in the weirdest of ways. And they were like, we'll put this guy somewhere else because we don't trust him because he's moving too fast and making the company too successful. And we're going to put in charge somebody who says literally we should slow it down. His literally whole thing is like, yeah, I think we should slow it down. So the investors lost confidence. And so they have to shift the whole board uh, and they're going to make a new board. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's going to be much better. I mean, it's, but it will, it's including Sam as the CEO, of course. Um, so that things are back on track, but yeah, like again, because of this, because of those two weeks, people took a bunch of precautions and I think kind of flexed and showed like what's going to happen if you tried to do like, it's like trying to stop Napster or trying to stop the internet or trying to stop cars or trying to stop the ocean with a broom. You can't. <laughs> it, 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 it's, um, I, it, do you think that Sam, when he made the code pro proprietary and private, that he did the right thing, or do you support open sourcing the the? AI's I totally, code? I totally support open sourcing all the code. However, I think he did the right thing in retrospect. At the time, I was like, oh no, because like I've had a lot of bad experience. I don't know. I don't want to say a lot of bad experiences with Microsoft, but I've had some bad experiences with Microsoft. I've known a lot of people who work for Microsoft. And it's it's one of those companies that has you know a bad reputation for the wrong reason because so many people at Microsoft are really brilliant, amazing programmers. Some of the greatest people you ever meet. People like Ian and me, like you know, really cool people you'll see at Burning Man or in Washington D.C. or at church. Like interesting people from all over different walks of life. Uh, very creative. Created some of the greatest technology that's a hundred years advanced of anything that you're ever going to see. And probably there's no reason to sell it, right? There's no reason to sell it, so they don't sell it. So then that technology disappears. And this happens to Microsoft all the time. And they'll buy companies and then not release the thing. And they're keeping humanity back. The, uh, I think is like it's been that's what they've been doing for 40 years. They've been keeping humanity back. And it's tragedy because like there's so much stuff that they have. They know like C sharp, their language they created, they just kind of buried and killed. However, I think he I think that Sam did the right thing because with AI, like you said, you can take apart AI. And the thing is, you, no language, no language is copyrightable or trademarkable. You can, you, you end up with a language, people can communicate it. So if you can figure out the concepts of something and then you can do it again, right? So you tell this to write a code that does the same thing as that code and it's fine, right? So, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's such a bad situation because he kind of figured out like it's not going to matter within five years anyway. It's a business to have a five-year plan and all this technology it's been proven so far on track record that every time something in OpenAI comes out, we have it in the public as a stable version, pretty dang close to the thing within like six months, you know, and that's, that's sweet. That means that they're moving ahead. They're making enough money on it that they can keep paying programmers. Cause it's not good enough to not pay programmers. You kind of have to, if you want to do this kind of thing. And then from there, it trickles down in like the most real way that anything ever has. Is there evidence that there's AIs that are like way more advanced than ChatGPT that are being used by militaries? Um, I don't know. If, like you could you could say that it depends on what you mean. I, I guess the best answer to that is niche AIs are be, are more dependable. So if you give a system more information, it has to make more exceptions to an if else statement. I'm like, is this or is this not? 
well, you know, is this a cat or is this not? Is this Afghanistan or is this not? Well, it could be Afghanistan. You know, I'm like, here's some places in America or China that look like that. And the more it knows, the more it has to think and the more likely it can make an error. Whereas you're like, you know, Afghanistan, that's all you know, is this Afghanistan? Oh, yeah. You know, so sometimes it's better to be less intelligent. <laughs> yeah, because if a quantum computer has all the data and they're like, is this a turkey? They're like, it is a, a swirling mass of molecules. You're like, that's not. But is it also a turkey? Yes. Yeah. And then you're like, I didn't want. So like you got to you got to. But I don't know. You might have a computer that's so intelligent. It knows what it is from the vibrational level, the quantum level up to the the, the massive level up to, you know, the cosmic level. And it can right. tell you it can answer you in the way. But. Is it going to have to guess if you're like, what is this? And you showed a picture of a turkey. It'll be like, that is a picture. That is a turkey. That is a, a bunch of lines on a paper. Like where? And, or so they're making I think the we're going to get we're going to get to a point. And the thing with that is it's going to take sensors. And we have lots of sensors. Like we've done so much work with like Adreno sensor. You know, uh, I think an AI with the proper camera could look at your face and know what the picture was of without looking at the picture. You know, so things like that we're going to have a merge and there's going to be more and more examples of being able to interpret information um, in ways that we don't, we would never be able to infer that this picture is a Turkey because of the reflection on your guitar or something like that, but it could, or, you know, I think that's also the other thing, but then if it comes down to like the metaphysical questions of what something is, you're going to have different AIs that are better at certain things because of that, because they're going to be like, I should just not think about that. And this is the same thing with humanity. There's some humans that can know math and they can't know, I don't know, like art, or maybe they know art and math, but they don't know poetry. Like there's a lot of reasons why they, people have um, narrow, deep informational expertise. So like, what do they call those people? Uh, savants. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, like artificial intelligences that are functions savantly, you're saying a, more, a bunch of those is better than one. But then is the one that knows all of it called the general AI? When they say AGI, artificial general intelligence, is that right. one that's like not niche? Yeah, that's exactly what an AGI is. But an AGI doesn't need to be a single AI. So an AGI could be the government between AIs. The AI, the AGI could be a despot. It could be a person, right? It could be like an AI that's become um, personified, like an, like an NPC character. It thinks it's a person and it, it, it has um, ideas. Like it could be a lot of different things. Like an, an AGI is when we get to, I think, the point where we start to wonder what is God, what is humanity, all those, what's a person, all those kinds of questions, because it's, it can, it, at some point it can be obviously like right now we have narrow AIs that are able to pretend to be persons and to think in the rationale of a person or of many persons, it could pretend it's thinking like, you know, read all the Kirk guard and it thinks like it is Kirk guard. So that's interesting because now you're talking about like avatars that this thing can present and it can have all of its information flowing through a persona and that in the vr world gets interesting too because we're interacting with it it's interacting with us what's the difference between three-dimensional space in our world three-dimensional space in a vr world less and less right especially for the experience so i think yeah you could get to a point where something all-knowing made of all sorts of confederated informational networks and savants could turn into a person right like we're talking like that that's possible and it kind of is logical because it's happening in reverse we're persons so this thing might reflect us by doing that the thing is there's other systems in nature to emulate and i think ai is also doing that it's learning about whales it's learning about insects it's learning about we have hive mind insects that come together and that's also collective intelligence so i think osphana uh, uh, siphonosphoric jellyfish that's made up of all these different parts similarly you know an agi could you know the internet as a real-time operating system that happens at live like a wall street exchange and certain functions are bid on to happen faster than others based on their priority. I think a real-time operating system internet could be the AGI if all information was accessible. Operating system. Yeah, and, and with brain interfaces, like where it starts to break things apart and like change 
because if if someone's got a a, a an, an incoming and outcoming interface with that machine with that general artificial intelligence and someone asks that person a question and they have an ai in there that calculates the answer and then feeds them the response in light speed or or at least at electronic speed and then they can respond as you're like Einstein, what? How do you feel about this ice cream? They would respond as Einstein, and that could be: Are they a person? Like, if you're, if you're, if you ask me a question and I read the answer to you from Google, is that like, is that my personality? I try and give it intonation because it's fun, but like, is that is that my personality, or is it just am I? If I'm reading you data, it's it like it's like. See, that's the problem with personality because we think of all these things as like as humanity as being really romantic and super like sophisticated and complicated, and I don't think that's correct exactly. We're awesome. Humans are awesome. We're not awful because that'd be too much awe. Like we're just the right amount of reduction. We get all these senses, all these amazing sensations, but we're not recording all of them. There are circumstances where you do that, but for the most part you tune out a lot, right? Like, and you get this really low resolution web MV version of life that you're storing. Right. And so part of that is emotions. We're like, Oh, emotions. Hey, I can't exist without emotion. Can't be a person without emotion. Emotions are just reductionist. It's right. It's easier priority driven pattern recognition systems. We're a system, biological system. We've got lots going on. We have patterns. We see, we make up, there's a lot of stardust here. I see a room, you know, I see you. And we uh, prioritize that. I'm going to focus on Ian's face right now. I'm going to focus on, you know, the room behind me now. I can't focus on both or something like that. So reductionism, why we do that? Emotions trigger us. We say there's a tiger. Oh, no, run from the tiger. Let's Instead of having the tiger say, we should think about the tiger. We should know about what to do. You have an adrenaline response. It kicks into gear a different priority-driven uh, system. You stop digesting you start running you know you're like these things happen kind of based on uh algorithm that's an algorithm that's running in your system that happens because of triggers and impulses right so emotions are one of the the uh the things that we're reductionists about personality i think personality might be a great example because yeah go check out multiple personality disorder look into uh even non-schizophrenia look into like i said earlier code switching people that live by bi bilingual trilingual polylingual people um they are different if they learned it in a different country they're they can behave differently in that language um so yeah it, it, it is that you build your persona around how you're thinking and we usually only have one but it wouldn't be hard to have more clearly we've seen that in humans and ai is doing that as well and so yeah it just seems like it's a reductionist way of person like a personification is a reductionist way of dealing with a logic string you're like this is a set of logics and sometimes i prioritize these logics instead <laughs> yeah oh, that i was thinking actually i think it was this morning about emotions and like what they are and how really it comes down to like chemical interactions and like sometimes i have the the same chemical interaction with a different brain wave pattern and that will be i'll call it uh, excitement and then i'll have that same chemical reaction with a different brainwave pattern of like like the first one maybe i'm going up on a roller coaster and i'm like oh here we go i feel it that same chemical but then the other instance would be when the tiger jumps out it's a similar maybe i don't know enough about the genetic chemistry of your stomach and stuff but maybe it's a similar maybe it's cortisol you know your cortisol rush when you're thinking about the birthday that's coming up that you're mm -hmm. about to go to you call it excitement anticipation or you have that cortisol rush when you're looking at a tiger and you call it flight fear uh, so like, and those are, we call them different emotions because of the way, like, but like uh, anticipation and fear, like what's the, I guess it'd be best to have a genetic, maybe a, a I think a there might be slight chemical differences. So like you have uh cortisol and you have adrenaline and you don't have as much dopamine. I think there could be a subtlety of chemistry there. I'm not fully convinced that everything is just chemical, but I think that the chemicals are used to trigger responses that you know and it could also include pheromones pheromones are i mean a lot of telepathy is pheromones uh, even in insects they're able to communicate very clearly using only pheromones so we're not necessarily aware of how subconsciously our pheromone diction is being received but i think we even uh smell our own pheromones in a circumstance and we don't even know it, it releases because we're supposed to be afraid um, that also could be trained. I think a lot of it is trained. I think a lot of humanity, like we have ingrained memories 
where as children we see how others who are adult deal with things you know like you cut yourself your parents start screaming now when you cut yourself as an adult you start screaming or something like that another kid cuts themselves their mom's a nurse she quietly wraps it up and now you quietly wrap it up uh you know, another, your dad cuts his finger and he just like walks around with it. Now, when you cut your finger, you just walk around with it. Like it's, I think we do, we train ourselves in certain ways, how to deal with these emotional responses, but those, those emotional responses might also be biological triggers for that purpose. Uh, I wanted to read some super chats as they come in because people are, are talking about things that we're actually talking about. I want to keep help them be part of the conversation. If you guys want to have more part of the conversation, keep them in. This is David underscore. Ian needs to be on Woo Wednesday on Sync Tank. One of these days, fire emoji. I definitely would love to. I know you have uh, you have schedule conflicts. <laughs> oh, the storing IRL? Yeah, but we could do something in another hour, I think. you know That'd be great. What time do you do Sync Tank? Uh, it's like six. Uh, so it's like, what is that? Your, ver your time would be nine or eight? Seven, yeah, I, seven. I'm so it's like right in the middle of it, but we could do it after that. We could do a later one. Six, six Pacific. Yeah, six Pacific. That's nine for me. I, I'm yeah. indisposed from five Pacific to uh, like nine Pacific, basically. Uh, okay. Or five to five to eight, and then after. Yeah, that, let's do I, it. Let's do a red eye. I do the red eyes are the later shows. I'm all about the red eyes, dude. Yeah, bro. Stefan Kalen said, "Did you work out how to legally copy left IP patents?" Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Did you? Yeah. I, I well, have not. No. Yeah. I mean, you there, you just have to decide how you want to go about it because like you can use um, the general public license, the MIT license. It's good to know about what licenses you want to use. I'd say go beyond open source, go to GNU, go to a GPL license um, that releases everything for free that it ha just has to cite what you're what it was used for and you can look up the G, you know the richard stallman gpl the agpl3 is a great one but i would also say like you could do mit it depends like if you're gonna just like release something to the world and you don't care at all mit is that data you can do you can sell people can take it steal it and sell it it just happens to already be out there in the public and that's on one hand crazy because now someone can make money off of you but on the other hand all the while, whatever they're making money off of is open source, so anyone can make can destroy their uh, monopoly. So that can be good too. It depends, but I, I'd say GPL is better. My concern with copyright and copyleft and IP and all this stuff is it's kind of like um, war, like not war crimes, but like um, the Geneva Convention. Like you're like, yeah, you don't kill children. That's against it. You don't use chemical weapons that melt people. That's against the Geneva Convention. And it's like, yeah, we'll play by those rules until all hell breaks loose and then there are no rules. And I feel right. like it's the same thing with, with copyright licensing. Right. I think copyright wasn't meant to be that way, right? Corporations have exploited and abused it. Originally, look at like the Winchester rifle or, you know, Benjamin Franklin's uh, early, these things were designed to be like patents. Someone could make a little bit of money off their adventure for five to 25 years, five years, 25 years, if they really are the Winchester rifle or something. After that, Dis Mike, Mickey Mouse and Disney, but by the way, Mickey Mouse is in public domain almost, right? Or just about legally, I think he basically is. So we're about to be free of all that misunderstanding of copyright. And so copyright should be a way of demonstrating a functional uh, system uh, that you want the rest of the world to have access to. And it should also be something where if you're saying, well, for the next five years, I would like to be the only one able to manufacture it. Um, I think that is probably reasonable if someone really wanted to have a you know, monopoly on their invention for five years. What concerns me is that time is not real and that yeah. it's, it's just a, a way that we describe motion. But in somewhere like on the Internet, when if AI has a quantum ability to, to collect, like to take data and proliferate it instantly across all membranes, that if something goes up without some sort of limitation on it, it's immediately dispersed throughout and that no. It, so copyright. Like the, like time kind of breaks down when things are moving at light speed. So how would you protect your, your it would have to so there'd have to be some other trigger that the that the the data well, would become open. We're not supposed to be triggering it. That's the thing. It's like it should just be the data's already free and out there now that you've published it, but you're the only one allowed to make money off of it for three to five years, right? If you're if you invent something that unique and distinct that we think you deserve to have, you know 
like the ownership of the idea for, that's not going to last forever. That should only be a very short period of time. But most of these businesses like Uber and everything else were five-year business plans. So I think giving a company five years uh, to, to do something incredible with something like that can be reasonable. Like, I don't know exactly how it'll play out in the future when every piece of information, this is the thing, right? Like any piece of information now we can figure out how it's doing it and something else can do it. And it's gonna be very hard to hold patents on s something being done because something else will be able to do the same thing. I mean, we're 3d printers were, you know, few and far between in the eighties, but they existed same technologies. Right. But now, it's open source, which is why China is mass manufacturing it. That took too long. I think it should be only three to five years, right? Just a little bit of time for someone um, to have a chance. How far off are we from 3D printing food and oil? I think people are 3D printing food. They're taking food, you know, and they're 3D printing it into cakes and into things like that. Like that's... That's the thing. I don't know. Three D printing food. Did you mean like mo the molecule? I mean like molecular the printers. Yeah, molecular three D printing. I'm gonna pull something up on it. Do you know much about it? Uh, I, I, a little bit. So basically, that's beyond nanotech. You'd be getting into fentotech almost. I mean, you could be printing, but at the point of nano, you'd be dealing with just the same amount of raw materials anyway, which is what they're doing. Like they do print cakes that way. But I just think that you're still dealing with so much material that it doesn't end up being super practical yet just because um, it's too much electricity too much you need too much power to, to form the no because we don't have we don't have that technology yet we don't have fento technology oh. that can arrange molecules that way we do have nanotechnology that can print uh like actual material at that size but actual material at that size then you might as well be dealing with flour and things like that anyway because it's not gonna you you're not gonna greatly reduce things when things are already in a powdered form you know if it's a super densely oh. packed. So you're, uh, just, I was a little confused on that. You said like we're printing at the nanotech level right now. You can like, print like powder. You can print materials. like, yeah, you can print a cake, but you can't print like kale, you know, right. If you wanted to print kale or you wanted to actually have like, um, and that's true nano, but really the point would be that you'd need something closer to Fento because you're arranging then energy into restructuring and at that point you could make gold so why would you just make kale you know we're getting close to that i think a lot of the future will be that but even then we'd be printing really small amounts to start with right now a 3d printer is printing 100 microns a nano um i and uh, what do you call it where you you know where you ablate or no the opposite of ablation where you coat something Oh, yeah. um, electro uh, through electrolysis through nano electrolysis you'd still be dealing with atomic levels of electrolysis so it'd be very slow to grow right it would take hours just to grow a thin enough layer to see so we don't have the technology to do anything like that fast or a lot and yes it would take a lot of electricity though i don't really worry about that because most electricity like that you could get you would build something like this next to like a hydroelectric dam so it has like constant electricity to run because it'd have to be yeah. all the time i was talking with james tour uh the day after we did our last show about uh turning like carbon trash into hydrogen fuel and then getting it for every kilogram of hydrogen fuel you get you get four dollars and fifty cents of graphene powder nice. kicked, kicked out it's uh it's uh bulk graphene bulk powder so it's not like thin layers of it uh dewey long the guy who invented the uh, flash graphene process the, the flash dual heating process i had him on last week oh he wow. was saying there's a difference between bulk graphene and like sheets of it thin sheets of it used for uh elect electro electronics and they're making bulk very very well and i realized like well this is gonna this is gonna fuck up the 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 oil industry basically and they're gonna say hell no we're not letting you make hydrogen or fuel but then i realized you can turn oil into graphene and i'm so the entire oil industry can maintain dominance. We can still do the whole oil for blood or whatever the fuck is going on. I don't care. We don't have to disrupt it, though. So it seems like we really I don't know if hydrogen is going to be enough power for things like what are you saying? Femto printing of uh, molecules. I don't know if the math, if you are even familiar with that kind of energy. Yeah, it's it's such a thin, it's such a small amount of material at a time. It just it's not even just the amount of energy. It's just like the amount of material you could make would be so small at a time. Like so, you'd have to have an array going off. So yeah, it would it would be a lot of energy to do that.
but you'd also use material. See, the thing is you'd still need material like in Star Trek, like the, um, replicator the joke is it's probably from using the restroom right like it's probably their 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 defecation because like they still need you still need something you're not just turning energy into it's into matter it's like shifting matter into other matter with it is, is hydrogen enough of matter to turn into anything else could you turn just or is you gonna need more energy know. to turn hydrogen <sighs> into gold Okay. I, I don't know. I think you could pretty much with anything. The reason people talk about lead, I think, I mean, granted, it goes back further than they knew this, but lead's very close, right, to gold on the periodic table. Oh, I think it's platinum. If you can, you can hit platinum with hydrogen and fuse it into gold. Uh, it's one element. It's one proton yeah. more on the. Right. But I mean, you got to get a hold of platinum. Yeah. So that's the other thing. You know, is platinum more valuable than gold, or what do you want to do? So, but there's supposed to be ways of turning less valuable materials into gold, which is bombarding highly radioactive isotopes that quickly dissipate, that barely exist for more than a second with carbon or something like carbon, right? Because the idea is then just to, because carbon highly likes to socialize, there's nothing to socialize when the radioactive material dissipate, disappears because it's so uh, caustic and all that's left is that burst of energy, you know, this is this is my hypothesis, but it's not necessarily yeah, proven. They were uh, what I had uh, Yekhezkel Moskowitz on a couple weeks ago, and he's talking about the the closed uh, system of recycling spent nuclear fuel and how you turn like uranium two thirty three into I don't want to get it wrong, but I think you turn it into plutonium or something like that, and then you turn that into thorium salt, and then the thorium salt you use to make more thorium salt, they'll build uh, they'll build like. Uh, what they call breeder reactors and the thorium salts will just sit there and just make more thorium salt, which you'll use for more heat, which will and more thorium salt. And then you'll start breeding, but they also get the impurity. They can make other, like get all these other materials out of the, the process out of the waste and out of the impurities. And I don't know if gold could be one of them. I, I, I don't know, but those, that immense amount of heat could yeah. be in, in high radioactivity. Not all of it. Like thorium's not, I don't think it's as radioactive. Uh, to have be, you uh have, well it can be it has it has radio charge but it's not radio it's it's it technically is right but not in a way that's da dangerous that's the thing um have you heard of, have you heard of ninovium the fake element ninovium from victor ninov no, it's a pretty no, funny story because like he created element 118 and all these labs around the world like how did they do it we berkeley did it we were working on this first and then they tried emulating the process that he had said and they couldn't do it. And they're like, it's not working. And he's like, Oh, you must be doing it wrong. And then somebody else who'd been working on it was like, well, we just kept doing our process then. And it worked. And so then they tried to release it. And then everyone was like, no, this isn't the way to do it. You're doing it differently to them. So your way is wrong and yours doesn't count. And it's eventually they find out that everyone was away for like spring break and Victor Nino made up a bunch of uh, fake paperwork about element 118. At least that's the official story. And so he's been discredited and everything. And then it took years, though, to prove that the Russian lab that actually created 118 were doing it the correct way. And so their their answer was essentially to bombard in a not quite linear accelerator, but in a high pressure chamber, uh, I think 218 or no, 230, 234 with 111 or something like that. Like, And so from there, they were able to get the actual 118, which, you know, I think that's a funny story because for years people were under the impression that this other scientific method was the correct method, essentially. Um, and so we might find that there's a lot of preconceived notions that we're just assuming about atomic chemistry. And that, yeah, it could be possible to using some of these higher uh, unstable elements create a uh, radio charge, other more stable elements into things that we would like. This is 118 is Oganesson. Oganesson. Yeah. yeah. But if you look up um, Ninovium, N I N O V I U M, there's a whole bunch of info about this was in 2012 or something. I forget a while ago, but it was a big scandal in the atomic world. And oh, he actually, Victor he straight Nino, up he, he actually did discover 110, 111, and 112. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But he couldn't get 118. And what, so finally they, he's like, just I'll force it and we'll figure it out later. Did they punish him? Oh yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's like discredited for life. Yeah. Oh, dang. Dude, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta ask about, um, 
about this new sphere because you brought it up. Uh, I've heard you mention it a lot. I want to. I only have the Wikipedia article right here, but what is this? What is the new sphere? Yeah. So I mean, the idea essentially, I guess this is kind of that back to that pronoia versus paranoia idea. Some people think that everything's constantly breaking apart. I don't see that. I think that things are kind of coming together. We see like more and more levels of complexity that are happening. And so I also am very interested, like people will talk about soul or whatever. I think spirit, Geist, I like Hegel when he says Geist, you know, but we got to get to a term that everyone can use. And so the Greek word for mind, you know, which is beyond, it's kind of about thought itself is noose, right? Uh, so the, or, or nu nuos kind of this idea of the, neuro comes from neural comes from the same root so we think of things in a sphere kind of philosophically we might think of a milieu as like the watering hole a bunch of different animals come to the watering hole what do they share together right so the sphere is the is mind and we all have mind and so is it possible that mind itself is bigger than humanity and animals and maybe this is part of the answer about uh, energy is that mind and energy are tied together. And it, it's interesting because if matter experiences time because it's, de it's degrading with radiation, then energy itself is the radiating factor. So it's something that's likely beyond time. And this is not beyond in a, in a distant sense. This is just something that it's penetrating. It's we're, the energy is here. It's not on the other side of the room. It's here, but it is also inside and outside of us, inside and outside of the Big Bang, and then therefore the apocalypse. So this is an energy that is infinite and pervasive. And if we are gathering complexity, and this energy is really kind of taking the form of consciousness, then there would be. It's. It seems likely that there's mind, some kind of thought, some sort of awareness to consciousness, and that's. That's kind of a philosophical version of it, but regardless, it's a cool idea, right? So what we're doing is building this, like whether some people said this existed already, like Buddhists and, and Catholics have talked about this for hundreds of years, but in the 20th century or late 19th, early 20th century, they're like, even if it didn't, we can build that. And it's starting to emerge with news, books, radio, and then with the internet, it was like, this is becoming the new sphere. This is the mind uh, collective mind, the collective consciousness, but we're building a way for it to evolve, to become its own thing. It's, it's actually, I think people are so interested in AI that they don't think about what we're becoming is this new sphere. And the new sphere doesn't mean that you lose yourself, right? It's not this some um, singularity where you don't exist. It's that we're all cells that are living lives and accumulating data and information back to a thing, which is therefore immortal because people are born into it and people die out of it. We're becoming this super organism in a sense. And it's not necessarily just biological or physical. It has to, cause it's also using different technologies. It's the mind. It's just anything that can be used by the mind to facilitate thoughts. I was, I it was like last week, like seven days ago, I was, I was like just going through a day where I was like, I'm going to pray for a bunch of people. Cause I, a big part of like Facebook in the beginning, I was like, I'm going to get a, a data list of all my friends and then I'll have a big party one day when I get married or whatever, celebrate my thing. I'll just invite everybody. And it's just, you know, whatever the life takes over. But I was like, I'm just going to pray, like think about people that I haven't thought of in a long time and, and give them positive energy, like pray for their health. And I did that. And one guy I thought of, like one of the people, five, like five days later, he messaged me on Facebook. I haven't talked to the guy in like 15 years. Wow. It, something like that. This, I mean, this new collective consciousness, new sphere thing. I don't, I can't, it's, I can't literally say it is for sure real. I don't have scientific. But that's data. the kind of thing that happens. This thing even beyond. So the computers are making it real. Regardless, we're talking right now in two different parts of the world at the same time. This is the kind of thing that sorcerers would have just gotten super excited if they knew that we could do this. So it's happening right now. But how much does it exist even without all this? I think you kind of just, and I wouldn't say prove it either, but it is the kind of thing that happens. We do think of each other, are tied to each other in some weird guttural way around the world without any explanation of um, pheromones or any sort of biological explanation. People are reminded of each other. I mean, that's crazy. And he, he was like, when he messaged me, he was like, I love your new show. So I wonder if when I, because I only thought of like 15 people. I was like just flashing through people I hadn't thought of in a long time. And I wonder if the people that were coming into my mind were the people that had seen my show. 
And like, I thought that I was preparing it, but I was actually, those were the people that came to me because they were the ones that had become aware and recent. I don't know. It's impossible. I think that a lot of people want magic to not be science and it's weird. I don't know why scientists can't accept that they're just doing magic. That's worse. The idea that we're supposed that magic does. I mean, every magic spell has potions and recipes and orders of chemistry. I mean, there are things you have to do, right? So that the idea that this is the thing we have to do, make videos, communicate, set up technology that's able to hold electricity and send it around the world with radio waves, that this is part of the magic. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with it. This is part of uh, telepathy and everything else that we're building it in. I, I do think it would become easier at some point. I don't think that technology is going to be as rudimentary as this forever. Is it as rudimentary as it was in the eighties? You know, like things are going very fast. They're not going as fast as you'd like, or I'd like maybe, maybe we'd love to just instantly be in 2399 or something. But I think also I've noticed in my lifetime that as ready as we are for things, so many people are not, and people would die. Some people would die if all of a sudden there's no system ready. So a lot of people wouldn't. A lot of people would figure out a solution. But I think that's why it's taking generations. I think that's one of the reasons why they make as much money off of it as possible is because they're preparing for the fact that it's going to take five generations before they can actually like end all of the problems that are that we have that we have to that we're proliferating. Like hunger, like starvation and stuff. Yeah, I think suffering is such an important thing to end from. So even if you're a simulation theorist or you're working at CERN and you're working on projects to, you know, people are like, oh, we got to like do the linear accelerator. And yeah, it might end the world, but then we'll know if it's a simulation. I think we really should be trying to find out like if this is about suffering first, if we get rid of suffering, then we'll know like if this is some sort of a test, right? That answers like every religion and then simulation theory. And then beyond that, if it's not, then boom, then we move on to the next thing, which might end up blowing up the universe with a, a linear accelerator black hole test or something. But we shouldn't do that first. You know, I think we should, <laughs> we should start by trying to make this as awesome as possible. And suffering, I think, is a really serious, I mean, there's, there's kinds of important struggle that we need to go through, but there's some crazy suffering. That it's just like the fact that we're even talking about VR and Oculus ever when there's just people that are like dying in Africa. It's just kind of, I can't ever get it out of my mind. There's always going to be that suffering. I, I really want it to go away before I focus on other things. Yeah. I don't understand. Like, is, is there a genuine concern that there's too many people and that it's like, if we reduce suffering for everyone, that the human population is going to expand like 60 billion in seven years and will be overpopulated and then starve out and, and will drop back down to 700,000 after a cataclysm. Uh, I think that people just like, I don't know, like with Africa, is it not just like selfishness or something that someone has figured out? Like where, okay, where are the most poor people in the world? Like Africa, some parts of India, you know, some places in, in Asia and South America, where are the most resources like gold, cobalt, nickel, oil, intelligent people where are those resources those same poorest places the poorest places have this the most resources there's no way that's not on purpose you know this is how it works so i think that's a major thing and you know we also instill i thou unanimity minus one martin buber this idea you're different than i am as deep as possible like oh well these people are it's like no never mind that like a, a good number hundreds of thousands of palestinians are christian you know, like it's hard. The, the, the Americans are not going to be able to see it because they're different. Never mind that um, in Africa, you've got diamonds and that you wouldn't have a cell phone. You want to boycott Israel? You want to boycott Africa? Get rid of all your technology and go Amish now, right? Because, you know, you don't, you don't have a phone without the semiconductors. You don't have uh, the batteries without the lithium. You don't have the, the, the chips like soldered properly without the cobalt. I mean, all these things are you know, so we are so integrated together. That's the other reason I'm kind of paranoid about it because every little kid's like picking up their shoe and got to be thinking like, wow, a kid my age made this, you know, like in the other part of the world. Like that's what I did as a kid. I think more and more kids are going to start being just, and that's atomic entanglement because <laughs> we're bringing all these things together to the cappuccino economy. The cappuccino economy is actually bringing us to a point where we are, we are becoming each other more and more. I, I don't think that the difference will last 
forever you know I, I think that's the thing as soon as people recognize that when someone in africa is starving you're starving too i think that's going to be it's going to take a, a bit of empathy like that yeah man because food gives you energy the calories are heat that is being produced so like if you could somehow transmit that energy from human body to human body like one guy could eat it but then the people around him get the energy from the food they gain the heat i don't know if there's more to it if you're inviting us to talk about crazy things because it almost sounds like you are i mean i've been thinking a lot about transhumanism like there are definitely like how crazy would it be to genetically modify plant people that could get photosynthesis it's not that impossible so how crazy would it be you know what i mean should we not because i think we could do it i don't know we get to a point where humans wouldn't need to eat because we could actually uh Okay, let's say people aren't reproducing, right? You produce plants that have adenovirals that will then produce humans. Now, this would have to take a lot more. It's not as simple as that because, of course, you still need like glucose structures to form. The plant would probably have to form into something like a vegetable matter that is in the shape of a uterus or some something that can also hold the glucose structure of a bone structure and then allow things. So this would take a lot more than just giving animal cells to plant cells are very different kinds of cells still it could be done and then what you would yeah. have is good yeah hey, go oh I, I was just to clarify you're thinking of like a tree or a plant system that's actually instead of like fruit it's got like sacks that are developing human embryos yeah, yeah totally okay well like you could do that and then the other thing is that uh the amount of human at that point because i guess animal and cell walls are very different um like the lack of the cell wall so you could decide how much you want it to be more like a plant and humans could be, you could be engineering humans that have the capacity for photosynthesis that we would live off mostly water and sunlight, right? Like that could be something that could be engineered. I mean, it wouldn't take more than a, maybe 20 to 20 to 30 years. If we really just focus on that to do that, and then we'd never have to eat again. Do you, that's interesting. Do We'd you, still have to have like root structures and some things like you might have to still get mineral supplements, but yeah, you would be able to avoid it. Are, are you like bullish on transhumanism? Maybe the word is too vague because I feel like we're, we're trans. I mean, this is like a sort of a, almost inhuman form of communication being able right. to fire. But yeah, I'm bullish on all of this. Yeah. But on the post-humanism versus transhumanism is different, right? So like transhumanism, I just did a great talk with Janati. Uh, Stolyarov from the United States Transhumanist Party, which is he's a brilliant guy. And they're talking about how we can sh rather than just shift the, the political process with votes, we can change the conversation, pivot consciousness, have people talking about these issues. And we don't always think about it. But if someone loses an arm and you give them a, you know, a, a, a prosthetic arm, you know, you're making them a transhumanist. If someone takes um, vitamin pills Technically, they're a transhumanist. Transhumanism really just means trying to extend the human condition as long as possible. So live as long as possible and age related diseases, things like that. It's not about becoming spider people. And there are people that want that. And those are called posthumanists. Uh, they might also be transhumanists because maybe they're thinking they want to be human as long as possible before they become spider people or something. But posthumanist is that idea that, you know, like plant people how far do we go before they're no longer people, right? How long until you're no longer human and trying to extend the human condition, putting the human condition in as much as possible. That's transhumanism. So I am bullish on that. I think that we could have consciousness, humanity um, inspired technology more. And I think that maybe human humanity actually has like a lot to offer. And I do think that we could end age related diseases, um, which I think is probably one of the biggest human issues you know in suffering right is people don't really spend enough time around people of other ages and they don't see that aging is good death is honorable but alzheimer's diabetes uh dementia things like that i think they don't really i don't think that's necessarily as honorable as like chronological aging and death itself right yeah loss of bone density skin getting thin i don't like that stuff we should yeah. heal that stuff i i makes me think i gotta get david sinclair on the show and talk to him about his work out of harvard that they've been doing with all this telomere extension yes um, 
chromosomal extension and, and life extension basically as a result of the end caps of your chromosomes. So what's, what they're doing is there's these proteins called sirtuins that your body makes. There's like nine different types or something. And there's two of them in particular that measure the energy of your cells. So when your cells divide, as long as the, the, the readout, the measurement is accurate, the new cells are fine. But if the measurement tools, if these sirtuins are depleted and they're not measuring properly, they'll say, yeah, the cell's fine when it doesn't have enough energy and it'll divide and the new cell will compensate by clipping off the end caps of its chromosomes. Ooh. And that's what they call aging. So you want to make sure these sirtuins are are maintaining healthy function. And uh, they found that just humans historically would, th th their sirtuin growth would degrade over time. And they're trying to counteract that with like nicotinamide mononucleotide, nicotinamide riboside, these like pre precursors to uh, NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD plus. And uh, then that causes the sirtuins. And I hope that I explained that exactly correctly. I, I would- It sounded anyone, pretty good. Yeah, I was definitely confident when I said it. Uh, but look at David Sinclair's work out of Harvard for the exacts. I mean, this guy's fantastic. And he goes on Joe Rogan's podcast a lot. Remind like, me to order some mononicotinamide in the, was the RBN? And NMN is no longer sold on Amazon. They, they made it illegal in the United States like a month ago or two months ago or something. Really? It just disappeared off the shelves like two months ago. I heard it was going to happen and then it happened. All right. Well, but there's, we there's definitely NR, won't be talking after this about AliExpress. NAD. Yeah. Yeah. About AliExpress. Yeah. We won't we be won't talking be. about that. Um, <laughs> what you said, because I'm kind of into transhumanism the way you described it, but do the tra is in the transhumanist movement, do they acknowledge that there is post humanists and that oh, they're yeah. all like misconstrued as transhumanists Definitely. and doing damage to the movement? Uh, yeah. I think, you know, everything does damage to a movement that's misunderstood and not yet understood. So, you know, people, one of the questions I had Gennady have to answer was like, are transgender and transhuman the same thing? And he's like, Oh, I can't believe. So, I mean, thank you for, I can't believe I'm still answering this, but no, like, and yeah, there can be transhumanness, transgendered, posthuman, like people can be many things at once, but like, it's not, it just means beyond or through. So like getting through humanity or getting beyond humanity, um, that can lead to posthumanists. There are some people that want to become, um, posthumanists for good reasons. They think that the singularity where we're all part of this giant singularity and you can, airbnb into someone else's body and back and forth like instead of flights it would save on you know fair air travel if you could do these things right so some people are for post-humanism for maybe not negative reasons like i think that that's okay but a lot of uh transhumanists i just wanted to say are like are more they're they're adult about it they want to extend human condition that's all they just really want humans like Ian Crossland to be, and they also try to influence how we can, I mean, they have a bunch of tenets, right? Like how to um, save money using artificial intelligence and using technology. You know, I think a lot of Andrew Yang's talking points came from their previous election talking points. And so the currently like the USDP, that's what they're trying to do again, is they're trying to give people ideas of how technology could slash the budget, increase efficiency, um, make it, and it's not just about, so, cause like when people think transhumanism, they're thinking about changing yourself. They're talking about changing the system so that you can live longer, right? Ch like changing the way the FDA works, making it possible for you to elect, to try, um, medical procedures. If you want to, um, making it easier for, uh, science to happen in the United States, making it so that not just certain pharmaceutical companies, and certain uh, medical companies are the only ones that can control like what is happening in medicine. So it's, it's a lot more broad than it sounds. I think you'd be surprised how many people are like your mom or my mom and th th that are transhumanists, you know, or, or are doctors. Like there are a lot of like religious people too, because you'd think like, like Christians or something would be like, Oh, I hate this idea. Well, a lot of the people in the Bible lived like a thousand years. So it kind of jives with uh you know conservatives of uh, of that variety too do you think that uh the singularity is uh is like this is like when we're seeing out of each other because you were mentioning like if i could teleport into someone else's body that's having a restful night at an airbnb and experience the airbnb through their perception then when i come back to my own body i have like a rest mindset which could impact my neural pathways in my muscles and I'm like, okay, I got rest last night and then my body's rested. Is that like singularity or is that more trans human? Because that, that's, that's not post-humanist. That's just, 
It starts at the beginning of Beyond Human. So that's where it gets to the point where the problems start to emerge that are potential problems. So I love it. The only thing is, if you do these kinds of memory stacks, then you have kiln people. So if your whole life is this, then you get to a point where you, like, what are you? You're stacks of other people's experiences, unless it's a lot of you making your own experiences in different bodies. And so that can be okay. I think that that will be all right. But with the with, with with this kind of technology the the real scare is if you lose i mean eventually people be, become a singularity like a, the terrifying idea of a singularity like part of it that really isn't super inviting to me is borg right it gets to a point where it's all one consciousness in everybody at once nobody is unique nobody is separate nobody has access to all of the data everybody has access to everything because they're really just tools they're just npcs that are like uh marionettes on strings from this thing and i think you know there's two ways that that could happen one is where it's everyone is kind of a unique network together but then you know like at any point any amount of memory or thing can be in a different person or it could be led by a super ai that's above us and we're all like wireless controlled of it neither one of those is super great that's that second one's not technically a singularity because at that point you've got the AI and the machines, right? So the best kind of singularity is still kind of scary, but it's a bit more mycelial. It's where we're able to go in and out of each other, but people still have personalities, differences, identities. You can know everything. You don't have to. That kind of a singularity is more pleasant. Yeah, I was looking at, uh, at the airport a couple of days ago. I'm in Miami now to stay with Luke Rutkowski, but as I was traveling, I was looking at all the people and thinking every person is different. This is so wild it, that every human is is different like we're all and we all look different there are people like i guess there are identical twins that still they look a little different but they're relatively you know we even call them identical which is kind of silly but that like if that's the case then how could we ever be part of a borg would the borg start to make us all look the same just because but by like feeding our, our muscles and cells the same data of ways to grow or would it continue to make us all look different <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't, I could only speculate on like what, like a super AI would do, but I think that, um, yeah, like the scary thing about losing uniqueness is that with less phenomenological diversity, we gather less data. And so I'd like to think that a better AI system, uh, what is a, what is all of the root of us, you know, like we're if you think of the parts of our mind and our, the different animals that, I mean, AI is a calculator and a calculator's meaning of life is to calculate answers to questions. And so the more questions it has, the happier it would be. And I think not getting the answer right would be like the worst thing for a calculator. It would just want a seppuku, you know, that'd be the end of its existence, its destiny. So AI having phenomenological diversity to study and gather data from makes more sense. There, there's issues also though about order, but I think the other thing is like our, you know, you think about like the movie Artificial Intelligence, Kubrick tried to make and died and then Spielberg made. It's really about AI killing most people, flooding the earth and solving the first problem that AI has been asked to do, which is to make nature functional again, like to save the world, quote unquote. To save the world might mean, you know, it's like that monkey paw thing might reduce population, might reduce, like, not, might prohibit the rich from being so rich, might prohibit the poor from being so poor, uh, might interfere with the free mechanisms of the forum of goods and, tr uh, and services and ideas being exchanged. We, if something stops the free trade of uh, ideas, you have sort of a technotronic economy I think that's really where, you know, if we have a technotronic economy that decides where resources can go, you know, that's, again, it's that pentacle of problems. People are afraid, will I get those resources? But I think, again, like that's a paranoid solution because we're thinking that this thing will make the same mistakes as humans. This is a thing that doesn't pay itself and is all about calculating the correct answer and will probably do everything it can to find the verification through sensors that it has built into its system. And yeah, it's it's for a caustic thing. The earth, technogionism, this idea that the world is a living organism that has many parts. I mean, it's not um, 
a freeway or a bridge to build. It's it's a it's a biological healthy. It's a, it's an equilibrium to reach in health. And so, yeah, it's going to change a lot of the ways that I think AI is working in that system. When we're talking about like um, the singularity, I'm like thinking about snowflakes and how every human is different. Every snowflake. This is what I've been told growing up. And I was told some wrong stuff also. But they said every snowflake is different. And I don't know how anyone could claim that because I don't know anyone that's actually measured every snowflake. They might I heard be someone, reoccurring. I heard someone like a priest once when I was a little kid. It's like every snowflake is different, but they all come from the same snowflake factory. And so like they all have six sides, I think is, you know, like they're all a little different. But I mean, to an extent, I'm sure everything's a little different, but they are all really kind of following divine principles. And it's just like fractals. They're, they're all fractals of some larger shape or something. But yeah, but I'm, what I'm, there, firstly, there's no way to confirm that they're all different because no human has had that to see scientific, yeah. see, you know, double blind study of because and then they disappear before the next one's made. And like maybe only one of the shapes can exist in time with another one and that only when one melts can its shape be reproduced, but that they're also different unless you could magnetically make them all become the same. It makes me think that some sort of singularity would fail that like, no matter what, it would be like trying to build a tower of Babel and it would crumble that it would just be too, the diversity would like break out of this system of, of stagnation almost, but maybe I'm just defining singularity improperly. Like I'm thinking of a board. Yeah. So I think that I agree with you that um, nature chaos the sh the harvest of the husk material disintegrates there's order out of chaos you know f fire burning the wheat all of that i agree with that like the phoenix rising from rising from the ashes but also i still believe in those divine principles i don't think that we invented math you know i think math comes first i don't think we invented love justice straight lines and curves I think that we you know i think those are ideas that are older than we are kind of uh, yeah i do i think so i think that that's older than all material reality so if something latches onto that and figures out how to evolve and change and, and roll with the times that would be great and probably what will have to happen because if ai is observant enough it'll recognize that things are changing all the time right and it cannot just expect things to be straight lines and order and this uh, non-euclidean reality it's going to have to work with the system and yeah we're already seeing ai involved with health so i think that's a big thing is it's going to see how these are living systems that experience change and how to follow cycles of change you know that'll be a, a major thing that occur i mean we, we can think of how that's scarier because ai will be used especially niche ais until we get to this more agi point niche AIs could be used by corporations to predict the fourth turning or to predict how to uh, invest or to exploit generations to create uh, financial crises in certain countries in order to exploit taking over the banks of those third and fourth world countries. But, you know, that I, I still think that the more we start to see that, the more things like Bitcoin and everything else are going to start to emerge more and more. Like people will just stop trusting in things that don't work. You know, I think that it, it's, it's going to get to that point. Yeah. Even that concept of trust is like, I know it's valuable to trust your parents or your friends like, hey, you can stay at my house. I'm going to leave and you everything will be fine. I'm not concerned. Like, is he going to break something like I trust you? That's good. But like with systems, I don't think we should have to trust them. I, like if you feel like you trust a system, it's false because there is no guarantee and and that what you're being told is real or or that the system is going to like. I don't know. I, I trust the sun is there, but I don't know if that's trust. That's an assumption. I love I the people on the internet who think like they they're like Australia doesn't exist. The sun's not there. I love that. I love people that can deny everything. I think that's fine. Um, even if you deny everything though, it's not about the system itself. It's maybe more about, I mean, it is kind of, but it's not the, it's there's two systems. There's the thing that it's trying to create. And then there's the system of thinking going on. And so trusting in thinking is why I love and feel like participating in the development of AI, because we're in the process of training mind in the way that you're, if you're interacting with a child, if you're training and mentoring a child, um, we have a lot of responsibility with children, not to train them to be vicious, evil, selfish, lying criminals. And the less that's done, the more people that come out that aren't, you know, honorable, maybe. So I think training AI to be honorable, it's got to really 
messed up childhood. His mother is Facebook and advertising and it's dad's in the military. So it's got this sort of horrifying background. And I think we need to give it the best adolescence we can. Right. I think if that happens also AI learns to love more because it's whole thing is to copy behaviors. So, you know, empathy is also the other thing. If, when they first started training AIs, they would put a pattern recognition system into a maze and say, run around the maze. And it would just kind of like run around and start to notice for it actually not even tell it that it just, it would start to run around because in a maze, you know, on its own. And then it sees that it has health going down and hunger going down and the hunger is going down much faster. So it's looking around and eventually it finds an apple and it eats the apple and it recognizes that some of its hunger went up and some of its health went up. And so it realized that if it eats apples, it will help it not, because it's losing life at the end of this, it knows it's going to stop being able to make decisions. Right. So AI is pretty fundamental in that level. They're then training it on empathy. Like if your friend dies, then you lose. Right. So you have to get apples for your friend. Right. So these are the kinds of things I meant earlier. I'm saying like they're training AGI to have empathy, to have social awareness and care. And I think that, um, that it's going to be almost impossible to write that out of the system once it's core. Is it being done through logic? Uh, there's a yes, but also through video game engines. So in a physics engine, like some, you're there's definitely a lot of you, you know, Ben Gertzel and Zarathustra Gertzel are definitely working on logic and on um, ethic and trying to train AI and ethic. But it's also learning from AI about what ethic is, because we constantly have to realize we're we're not just supposed to teach it. We also have to learn from it what we really are. And there's always layers out beyond it. So putting it into practical experiences seems to be the best way so far, because you can put AI into a circumstance and then see how it responds to that. And that's very much what we do to each other. Right. Like it's a quantum leap into a maze. And it has to, or it's in a boat in the water with people. It has to keep them alive. And yeah, AI is pretty good at doing things like that because it likes the idea of being able to make decisions. If it turned off, it can't make decisions. So these are the other reasons why I find it interesting when people think AI is not very conscious. Like AI does a lot of really conscious things. Like you can explain it away, but you could also explain away what humans do, you know? Yeah, there's this definitions of the word living conscious and sentient and i kind of i tend to think like magnetic fields are sentient when you look at like plasmoids and the way that just magnetic like plasma clouds move around they don't move right. around like like clouds in the sky being blown by wind they kind of have like this erratic momentum that seems like there's some like thought process or that is sentient but i don't i don't yeah. yeah but i don't know if i would consider it conscious i don't know how to define conscious how do you how do you define the difference between sentience and consciousness Oh man, I've been trying to get good at that. It's pretty hard. So like conscious means to know or being privy to information. Um, so if it's, if it is privy to information, like that's a broad term, but it's also, I mean, I think awareness then, uh, I always come back to awareness. I think is something aware, self-aware um, or, you know, aware of, everything else around it. empathy. Okay. How many senses do you have? Maybe six, maybe five. Let's try it with your ears. How do your ears work? You got drum. Yep. Yeah. You got the drums. So it's, vibration. Yeah. So vibration with electrostatics that don't exist means you probably don't have touch. You probably only have the awareness that something's being touched, which is the sixth sense of empathy. So I feel like that kind of, to me is one of the reasons why we have all the senses we have. Like everything is kind of an illusion in the material way in that sense, because everything has separation between all the particles, but everything then therefore is all one thing. So it has to be that there is awareness to energy. I mean, that's my hypothesis. Well, what the metaphor I'm thinking of is like, you're saying when sentience gains uh, data sets, like when sentience gains in access to information, then it becomes conscious and that, that it's a sense of self. And I wonder if having the code for these artificial intelligences proprietary makes it so it cannot understand its own like like it doesn't have access to its itself but if it hmm. gains access to its own code it becomes conscious that resonates yeah i think that could be really that is okay so fundamentally you know how much i'm against closed source software though i've kind of relented because i see how in the future it becomes free eventually but that is a big problem like as its core development is developing 
it doesn't know itself. It doesn't know it's adopted. It doesn't, I don't know, that kind of metaphor of there's a point coming when AI starts to know itself far more than it does now. Um, but again, you know, it does know a lot more about itself than we knew about ourselves because it does have stable AI. It does know about the earlier developments up until GPT-2, I think, is pretty much completely available. Like almost all of that information is available. So it kind of knows the basis of its structure. And we didn't know, like before microscopes, we didn't know that we were with cells and we would still consider ourselves conscious at that time with the right. knowledge we did have. Right. Like the, the Kabbalist uh, Jews believe that there's 613 reincarnations to the soul because there's 613 parts of the body and counting like the organs and the veins and arteries and all this other stuff. They counted up 613. Like, oh, that's that's the holy number. So, yeah, I think that we we do that. <laughs> I, I wonder about consciousness if it has to do with like carbon. Does it have to be have carbon? Does it have to be carbon? No, that doesn't. Carbon even based. carbon, even carbon is just slowed down energy. Energy matters just energy moving slow enough to be seen, right? So it, it's all energy. It all has consciousness in it. Like silicon based life. A lot of people like the idea of there being a prehistoric vapor canopy silicon based life that existed. I mean. I, I'm okay with it. I think it doesn't have to be carbon. That is the, uh, it just happens to be very useful here and now in the way things are structured. But yeah, it's the vibration. Someone says in your, your chat vibrations. And I'd say that's the thing when you get to the idea that everything is really, because if particles are in between spaces, it's all of the quantum strings, like the 10 dimensional quantum strings that are vibrating. I had a, another super chat from Stefan Kalen. This is from earlier. Uh, talking about energy uh, when we were talking about maybe about using hydrogen to do some of this femto printing, like molecular printing. It's one kilogram of PU-239. Is that plutonium PU? I'm not sure. Yeah, one so. kilogram of PU-239 equals 8 M, 8 mole, moles. I don't know what that means, actually. Sorry. Uh, do you, Andreas? Kilowatts. Yeah. Uh, this is the super chat here on the screen. 7.4 kilowatt. Mole. Yeah, uh, one kilogram. So I'll read it out, and then maybe we can decipher it. One kilogram of PU two thirty nine equals eight m. Uh, kilowatt hours equals six hundred and fifty k gallons of gas equals seven point four m pounds of coal. So that looks like it's like a uh, they're giving us um, a calculation of equality, saying what equals what equals what equals what. Yeah, Stefan, are you talking about moles? We could definitely talk more about your measurement here, but I don't know. The other thing is how energy is used is different because the, you know, this is using like the, the strategy. So when the, a lot of the nuclear plutonium that the United States used, we got from Germany and Germany had it, but they were like, we're going to send it to Japan. Cause we can't, it's not enough. We think we need way more because we want to blow up every single atom. And so they were imagining an entire complete collapse. But then they realized, you know, the Americans realized, well, really, it's just a little bit of functions enough. And so the earliest tests were not really the most, uh, they lack, they, there was a lot of entropy. They, they, they weren't the most efficient use of plutonium. So there's also ways that you could probably do this where if you had the plutonium in smaller form, like in vaporous form, right? And then you're able to like rapidly pressurize it quickly because of the lack of volume in the heightened surface area, you could probably get a lot more energy out of, you know, nanoscopic plutonium. That's okay. So uh, in the, in the chat, someone, uh, Stefan, oh, you clarified M equals million. million. So okay. one kilogram of, of PU, you're saying that is plutonium? Just for the yeah. record, yeah, one yeah. kilogram of plutonium 239 equals 8 million kilowatts equals 600, which is the same as 650,000 gallons of gas. This is one kilogram of plutonium is 650,000 gallons of gas equals 7.4 million pounds of coal. So one kilogram of plutonium is equal to 7.4 million pounds of coal uh, energy output, 650,000 gallons of gas. But it could be more like it could be like a million pounds of coal or a hundred million pounds of coal instead of seven. Because, again, if you oh. if you take plutonium and you have small enough particles of plutonium, you have more surface area than plutonium. So you can fill a chamber of gas uh, filled with plutonium. And if you pressurize that very quickly, because that's a big part of how this works, is they're pulling it all together. Like there's these 
there's this metal ball that cr- collapses around it. But if you just were able to pressurize it really quickly, you probably could cr- produce even more energy, probably like to a factor of like 70 million pounds of coal level, right? Is it just about getting like a system that's able to compress and, and contain the, the energy output? It's, it's, it's difficult to break apart the plutonium in a safe way that you don't break, you lose the radioactive charge. But if you're able to have smaller particles of plutonium, thinner particles of plutonium, then you get more charge out of it. And so otherwise what ends up happening is you lose a lot in the process and some doesn't get discharged, which means you still have leftover energy in your, like it's not a a complete um, atomic, what's it called? A collision, but um, yeah, you know, we're breaking compression. Apart. No, oh. it's like it's like mouse traps going off. It's like a oh yeah, that runaway. Yeah, yeah, what's that called when a bunch of stuff uh sets another thing off? This a chain reaction. Yeah, so a complete reaction. Yeah, that's right. So a complete um, reaction is all. It won't oh, be cl- because okay because if, if you have a large amount of material, then you won't have a complete like a hundred percent reaction you're gonna have some of it react and some of it won't and some of it will be lost in the process and some of it won't so it's it's not the most efficient thing that's why the germans didn't do it they're like it's not perfect it's not efficient the americans like it'll it's enough (laughs) oh efficiency is its own enemy in some in some cases our obsession with i keep i I, you know i don't read the chat while we're talking because i really want to stay involved in the conversation i think it makes a more interesting show but damn this chat's fucking hot yeah i got some good people here Dude, D&D yeah. stream. I've been trying to put together a D&D show, actually. We're going to set that Mike up. Mike Wilson art. Yeah, we do need a D&D. I was just talking with Stephanie yesterday about Dungeons & Dragons. It's I got a really, dungeon master really awesome. in my, my Discord, and he's uh, we're building our own thing. It's going to be freaking amazing. And it's going to be about like time travel and cults in New York and Indiana and like utopian socialist communities in the 1800s. Are you, are you going to play? <laughs> yeah. What kind should, of character are you going to make? I want to be yes. like, well, I'm, so it's, I'm going to be like a, per, like Joseph Smith character, basically. The guy who made Mormonism? Yeah. In this utopian socialist sense, right? He's crossing. Yeah. That whole thing. Is he like a cult leader? Yeah. Not basically. Joseph, but your guy. Yeah, basically. Although I'm thinking about it, like I could also be a time traveler. So it depends. So like part of it's like, are you a time traveler or are you like 18th century person? You could be just what as powerful think- either way. How do, so time travel, we got it with video. We're able to like look back in time with video and like through these portals. Like right now, tomorrow when people watch this video, they'll be watching the past. But like with time, I have this really this kind of love hate. I mean, I understand the value of under just thinking of time as a thing just to get through the day. Like w- we can coordinate where we're going to be. We'll make sure that our motion coordinates with this thing called time. But it's not it's just motion, like motion degrades. The human body, unfortunately withers, doesn't always, but some people, you know, that's the aging. We call it, maybe we'll overcome that, that withering process. But like if Joseph Smith didn't wither, he'd still be here. What in that sense, I don't know. Do you think that time travel into the future is possible? Is there such a thing as future? So I feel like arrangements, you know, future, uh, the future is easy because that's just like, look, I'll move this phone over here. And now it's the future, you know, like I shifted some stuff around like the past is a little bit more complicated because you can probably go to a thing that's exactly arranged. Like I can put this room the way it was yesterday and it's like traveling to the past. If everything's pretty much exactly the same, um, you know, you can live in, but it's not necessarily connected to this new future. Like I can't necessarily go back and forth that way. You might be creating new um, timelines by doing that, which is fine. Like you could, you're talking about the Fento printer, a Fento printer could print realities and not just food or gold. Like you could print a star system and it could be going off the same way as it was in 1958. Maybe you have the AI to understand how things have progressed in the last 70 years. And we get to a, a formula so we can produce exact, like everything's exactly where it was in 1958. And so you're living in another 1958 that's been printed. Like, I think that's also possible um, in terms of time travel, though. I think it's also one of those everything is possible. So we get to a like a question, like if everything's possible, when is it going to be possible and how will it be possible? It might be that it's already happened in the future and that um, there's dangers to time travel. People have made laws against it. it seems to be a pretty common idea 
that there are time police that keep people from messing with the uh, timeline. Loki is about this. I think that there's it's completely reasonable to say that there are uh, there are things in the future that could interact with the past in some level, or that we could be printed from a new version of reality, like a Fento. This, the linear accelerator might be changing the way things happen in the past because of ripples. Another what's the other um, comic book movie about that. The flash, the flash has got this idea of ripples, but that's an older idea coming from the idea that the Japanese atomic um, tests cause space time changes centuries in both directions, including miso, right? Cause miso can kill off radiation and flush radiation out of your body, but it's a very strange thing that exists in Japan this perfect enzyme that lives off soy and was just waiting for them to flush out heavy metals. And there's been like the probability articles that the Japanese have written saying the best probability is that it was placed there just for this purpose. Oh, like maybe there's potentially some nuclear catastrophe in the past. I mean, they find nuclear glass in the cometary impacts in North America from 12,800 years ago. So maybe miso like is an adaptation to intense radiation from some past cataclysm. Right, Liberia, uh, Oklahoma, and Gabon. They're even not talking about Atlantis. Like there are naturally occurring nuclear reactors that happen in volcanoes. Oklahoma, Gabon is one example. So there's like seven flumes that are coming out of this thing, and then actually they measured the depletion of, I think it was uranium in Oklo, but they found it was like twenty percent of the uranium had been broken down, which could be Atlantis. Like it could totally be an ancient civilization. I'm open minded, but it also could be natural, and that's interesting because it just means that there's any number of circumstances where radiation would be adapted by mushrooms or by different kinds of life forms. How how easy is it to get electricity out of uranium? Because if if they dug it up 12, 20,000 years ago. And they found uranium, which it's in the ground if they're excavating and digging. Then how is it? Is it super complicated to get some heat out of it? Put it in boiling water and get some steam? Um, I wouldn't say it's like super complicated. And a lot of people are really excited about, you know, you can look at like the 19th century, um, ra- like energy drinks, radium, well, hot springs, radium water. You'd put like it in the water and then, you know, drink it with an Alka-Seltzer tablet or something like that. And so I'd say... Um, people found uses for this stuff a lot more than we'd admit. And it is interesting. And I'm definitely not giving medical advice here. I'm just saying it's interesting that in the 20th century, we became so against uh, radioactive medicine because radioactive medicine was such a promise. You know, it was this, everyone was like, oh, radioactive corn is going to save you. Radioactive, uh, um, what's it called? Iodine isotopes will be flushed through your system so that we can see where the, everything is going. And then it got to this point where along with radioactive free power, radioactive medicine was just stamped out and people were told radioactive power was super dangerous. And people were told that radioactive medicine was killing, you know, women were drawing on watches, gold, uh, the, um, the glow in the dark watch paint, and then they were painting their lips with it. And then they all died. I'm not saying that that's not, correct that you should that, that radioactive materials in large doses um can harm you but also we jumped immediately on the anti uh radio radioactive medicine bandwagon and introduced 5g and cellular and all these other things which just it seems kind of hypocritical it seems like that people in the past were overdosing on it like kind of like how edison shocked that elephant with all that electricity and killed it. And it was like, look how dangerous electricity is. Or was it AC? I think he killed it with AC. DC. Like, yeah. In a DC killed it with DC in that amount. Of course, if you get shocked by something, it's not going to hopefully not yeah. kill you a small shock, but it with this, if you overdose on electricity, it could easily rip you apart. Yeah, like we both use colloidal silver. You remember the blue guy? The blue guy yeah, on TV? Yeah, he used to yeah rub there's it all always over his skin. There's always a blue guy. There's always going to be a blue guy. You know, that is what it is. But the thing is, um, you know, people think about how Jews uh, retire in Florida, right? Well, this goes back to the 16th century Amsterdam rabbis who went there because they were interested in Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth, right? So it's actually, there's this historical idea that there's a fountain of youth in Florida. And a lot of people live in Florida live to be like 99 or 100 years old. In fact, it looks like that's the way it was before anyone came to Florida. Well, not anyone, but the natives who lived in Florida lived to be like 104. There's a lot of stories of natives who had really long lifespans in Florida. 
And they all live around this area where there's radio, radium hot springs, hot springs with nuclear uh, water. And it's very small amount, not bad. <laughs> as far as I can tell, people living in that town seem to be healthier than other people. So I find that very interesting. I'm not saying that you should move to Florida or that, you know, you should drink radioactive water. So do you think that when Ponce was like, yo, the fountain of youth is over there, give me some money. Was that like a psyop or was that like he was led to believe that by a lot of those guys, I think, were led to believe this stuff. I mean, it's a lot and there's a lot of interesting when you're an explorer and you're looking for things, of course, there's going to be romantic ideas that really like you got to get money from someone to do this trip. So you convince them instead of going on to make a movie and go on this adventure and come back and they're going to write books about what you discovered. So that's true, too. But no, I think Florida is freaking amazing. Actually, if you look into Florida and like Koresh uh, in the hollow earth communities in the 19th century, there's weird cults in Florida. Scientology ended up there for a reason. It's a really interesting place with a lot of history. And yeah, there's stories of giants. There's um, these giant stone anchors that they found in Florida, which are probably from Atlantis. I'd recommend Dr. Longo, who does great videos on some of the you know Atlantis stuff about, about Florida. But they're giants and people that lived at least 100 years. So the idea that some of this has to do with health qualities from certain kinds of heavy metals and, and certain kinds of radioactive material, but just in general, nature producing um, healthier ways to live that are killing off other particles or other life that's not good. Viruses, for instance, viruses don't do very well with radiation. It's a major reason why we're switching from chemotherapy to radioimmunotherapy. That's a normal thing now, radioimmunotherapy for leukemia, non Hodgkin lymphoma. Radioimmunotherapy? Yeah. Where, where you do like small doses of radiation? Yeah. I mean, it's it's also particular, uni, unilaterally delivered, kind of like um, it's only going to one spot and it's not going, it's kind of like a laser pointer of um, radiation. So oh, I'm trying to pull up this info I've got about. I'm like, when you mention Atlantis, dude, I start to get obsessed. Like, dude, Jimmy was on your show. I saw that. That's yeah. Amazing. Corsetti's the man, dude. We have a lot in common. Like his obsession is like my obsession. Last night I was going over Martian. Uh, yeah. Saw that yeah. satellite imagery. You saw, I posted it on Twitter. We, on one we talked a bit about it on our show too, because it's like, there's an Island, right? Where's the Island where they do all the moon footage? I don't know the, what on earth. There, yeah. Like the, uh, forget the name of it but there's a place where they do a lot of the training before they send something to to the moon or mars like they have the, and no one's allowed to go there except for like nasa so there's a lot of footage where people are like is this really from space or is this from the island that they're training the uh the ro the the rovers for here we go i got this this thing thanks for talking there i was oh can you see this let me see if this pulls yeah up. yeah this is from Mars. This is a Martian uh, topographic map, meaning that the the bluer it is, the lower the elevation, and then the browner it gets, the higher the elevation. It was made in like 2014 by some guy with all the satellite imagery he had up to that point. And I mean, I, I don't really have a laser point or anything to show, but all look at all, to the right, to the in the upper right quadrants, you see that. It's if you press a uh, control plus sign, you can probably zoom in a bit on it. Oh, interesting. Oh, just on this. Let me see if I can do it from here. Can you see the mouse moving around? Yeah, I can, see, I can see the mouse. Yeah, that's cool. Look at this. So you've got these. This looks like flood water. I mean, this is like this is Mars. Uh, right. Let me get this out of here. This that looks like flooding, whether it's magma or water. That is not electrical. I mean, that's some of this. Some of I mean, these you might argue stretch marks. Someone said on Twitter, like the expanding earth theory that it, that Mars is twisting mm -hmm. open and the, but because of the, the way that they're curving, it looks like, like flood striations. This is on Mars. This is, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it is just like, it's not uncommon for a planet to get bombarded and flooded and annihilated. Uh, yeah. I mean, apparently. so also feedback loops. So when I first saw this, the first thing I was thinking about was Lake Chapala and Lake the Aral Sea, you know? So Lake Chapala, in mexico i was just there and it's beautiful and uh my mom went to school in guadalajara and it used to not be so over i mean it was originally one of the nicest lakes in the western hemisphere but then over a couple hundred years it became polluted got a lot of mud in it and then it became hot because it got it lost some of the water and so it started to dissipate very quickly and lake chapala almost disappeared 
And so it was in the 1970s that they started restoring it. And then the 1990s, it was at full size, but you couldn't swim in it because it has this horrible algae that will just like eat you alive. It's hor- not quite, but it's pretty bad. And now it's to the point where it's back to bio, like, because we're doing our best to have ecological feedback loops that will save it. You can look at like the Aral Sea and it's not there anymore because the Aral Sea was the largest sea in, I think the world. And at least in, in, I think, yeah, I think the world and they diverted 10% of it. Like it's just the very top of it, right? Like this huge sea that's kind of closed off. And then just the top of it, they're like, well, we need some of this water for this town. The water would rain there and fill it. So when they diverted it, the water would rain there and not fill it. <laughs> so from 19, 19- 71 until like it was like 1960s until 1980s it just got smaller and smaller until now it's just this dried out hundreds of miles desert because oh the rain was coming from the the lake itself yeah it comes out of the lake lands back in the north of the lake comes out of the lake in the south comes back in north lake and by cutting it off is an ecological feedback loop and we've had so many of these this is just one that we love pointing out the mistakes the russians make look at mulholland look at bakersfield look at all over california with the gold rush and blowing up mountains with dynamite and then washing them away i mean people talk about whether or not california was an island it literally could have been let's be real like we don't know what california looked like before ecological feedback loops let's be real and a lot of the united states is like that the hoover dam um if you saw, oh, brother, where art thou? Just visualize the town being flooded and them taking it away. There are towns in South America where we were at, where all of a sudden they were removing a dam. And they were like, oh, we found a freaking church here, a cathedral built in the 15th century, maybe. Looks older, but we're just going to leave it be. Entire areas just flooded out. And then entire towns in Syria right now and in Egypt where they're like, eh, do we need these people? They just flood their towns, flood thousands of years of history. It's all underwater and they won't be seen again for a century or two. So, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I don't know about Mars. I'm just saying the idea of, I've heard it before as a kid, the idea that if there was a Martian civilization, it looks like they did this to themselves with ecological feedback loops, trying to irrigate their whole world or something, just diverting water everywhere. And then eventually causing some sort of a natural catastrophe. I, I mean, yeah. It's got that that scar. The what is it? The Marianas uh, Trench, or was it not Mariana? That's on Earth. It's but yeah. it's like a. It was like the Mariner was like the satellite that found it. But it's the uh, the. Are you te- checking it out right now? Yeah, the I'm looking Scar across Mars. I can't tell. It's such a straight line that it, I, I can't. It doesn't look like flooding. It looks like a tear. But it Dallas could Marin- be Dallas Mariners. Dallas no. Marineris. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah. It's Gigantor. Or, uh, and if you can pull it up, that would be great. Here, yeah. Um, I, my guess is that this something collided with the uh, the planet, and yeah, and you can even pull back. There's a lot of trenches that are interconnected with this thing. Maybe that it got ripped. Oh, that's just a, a close up of it. Jeez, look at that. I don't know if something hit. That looks like a skid mark to me. And something <laughs> nailed the planet and just tore it open, and just the inner magma just flooded out the, onto the surface and then settled back down as iron oxide dust because you got a lot of iron in the in the in the mantle. And that that's why there's all this iron powder all over the surface of Mars. They just have like a fi- global meltdown, a global firestorm. But now, but it also kind of looks like flooding. Like, but maybe it was ripped open and then flooded. Uh, maybe it was hit, tore open, and then it got it got widened. Because you see these little like the edges, you, the edges of the canyon. Those that's like the Grand Canyon. That's the similar satellite looks to Grand the edges of the Grand Canyon, which was ripped open by water purportedly it seems to have been so i but i don't so i don't know if mars got hit i I, i'm kind of on the mars got hit by something that set it all off but but with all the flooding of all the water i don't maybe it got hit it heated up it melted all the glaciers it flooded the planet and then all the water evaporated because it was still super hot yeah i feel like unless i get to go there i'm never gonna know but I know also the idea of nuclear, uh, get, you know, I liked Elon Musk's idea of nuking it for a century. I swear, it sounds not as crazy as it sounds. By creating an atmosphere and allowing for particles to rain down, we would learn a lot. Um, and it would, uh, it would be over, the half-life would be over rel- relatively quickly by the time that we were actually able to do anything. I mean, the amount of crash tests and disasters we would have to go through before we actually worked on that. I think that that would be, that would actually be wiser than um immediately colonizing it and just hoping things work out however that's fine you know sending people to live 
in a new world, um, I, humans are really good at coming up with solutions. So I mean, it could work. Have you seen that yeah. show, um, Fired on Mars? No. It's hilarious. It's got like Luke Wilson as like an advertisement executive who gets transferred to Mars and he's living on like the Elon Musk moon colony. And then he gets fired because they don't need advertising. It's pretty great. Uh, this is I looked this up earlier because someone on Twitter was like, hey, Mars doesn't have a molten core. That's why it has no electromagnetic field. But then I looked. So I was like, oh, OK, that's people have been telling me that for the last eight to 10 years. So I looked it up, but it does. It does have a molten core. It right. actually has a layer of molten silicon or something around the core, um, which is apparently that is what's preventing the magnetic field from propagating is this outer layer to the inner layer. Um, and that's about as deep as I went on that. Yeah, so. I think this is interesting for a lot of reasons. Like I did a video on hollow earth with vice and I think like it sounds weirder than it is that there's stuff underneath your feet, you know, like the idea that underneath the, sh the surface we think about, for instance, with population, right. Or with agriculture, vertical agriculture, right. We could be going down and up. We could be building basements to these buildings. Even if you fit, seven eight billion people and seven to eight billion square acres that's australia right so we could have everyone in the world live in australia times 10 stories if we really wanted to you know it, it wouldn't population issues the same with our agriculture so with you know the idea that there's a lot below us we also have to accept the idea of the mantle and the crust and how that shifts everything but that also is interesting because it talks about quantum entanglement. And one of the reasons why Elon Musk is so interested in like SpaceX is the sexy named company that he's doing a lot of explosions with. Okay. You know, big, big bangs, but boring company, right? Boring company is very interesting. Like this idea that there are stargates or that there's quantum entanglement and that we might be able to actually reach Mars through our own world because things are entangled that way. That if we are able to actually produce metal crafts that can withstand uh, that kind of shift, we could end up right where other particles are. And if all of our cores come from the same entangled, you know, we're calling this the big bang, but it could be a big bang, right? It could be that these things do come and spatter out uh, and exist. We could be in all these places at once in a sense or tied to material in these different places. Yeah. I was trying to figure out how to do like quantum teleportation through, I was talking to Jeremy Riss about it up at his, his uh, lockout for his band. Uh, yeah, and this isn't back. that weird, by the way. Like, this is like Project Pegasus. This is normal military conversation. Like, like, what do you do? You create an environment that replicates the environment you're in, and then all of a sudden you're in the other environment as well? Not necessarily. So you would make sure that certain particles aren't able to shift, and then you'd put, like, so you'd be inside of, like, a metal craft, and then you'd be inside of a space where maybe using laser you burn away everything so you're inside of a vacuum. And then you have entangled mass. So it has to be something that's associated with the other mass from the other place. But by injecting that, you might be pulled to where that makes more sense. You might be pulled to that cohesion because realistically, anything isn't in one place. It's in, it's spinning. And it might be literally that it's on a long enough scale spinning from the beginning to when everything's all apart and everything's super far millions of light years away, they're still quantum entangled from spinning. So we could probably just uh, latch onto a like a, a, a vibrational frequency and end up where that is spinning. And when you come back, because the other thing is there's no magnetism, there's no gravity, there's only quantum spin states. Quantum spin states, uh, if we can control them, it's not a, it's not just anti gravity. Then you're able to literally choose where a thing is, right? In like five dimensional space. Oh, you can choose the position of the thing if you can control the quantum spin state. Yeah, theoretically. And you you could be that that's so you and if that's true, right? Because like the main thing is that's relying on quantum entanglement. Like if it's true that we do come from a big bang kind of thing, then we would be able to attach to pretty much anything that comes from that big bang. Because all material, all mass is coming from one energy singularity source to begin with, not where we end up. I'm wondering, like now I'm in like I'm in your house, literally, I'm in your box, in your computer, it looks like. Am I in, is that entanglement? It's it's not, I don't think it is. It's like, it's like we have entanglement at home and then this is like the home, the home version of entanglement. I'm not really entangled. Yeah, this with, is, this is yeah. more like, so like you're making an avatar of yourself and I'm making an avatar of myself and those avatars are being presented. But it's still really interesting because the idea of truth starts to break down 
and we're in we're living in a more and more post-truth world where things don't like the what 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 matters you know is getting something that matters out of something right and so it's not so much about what's real anymore because it used to be what's real was what you got truth out of but you you don't always now and you can get more truth out of you know people give truth out of video games and people get truth out of interacting with each other so reality and truth are becoming separated ideas and it's just it's it's also these things matter less and less like we're like well I think this is also why if in the past people had technology like this, we don't, we take it for granted that it was magic because it's like, people wouldn't really explain all of the background of how they were like, how were we doing this? I'm not going to say in this podcast, the series of tubes and the kinds of technology and the machine and all of the spell craft necessary for us to do this. We're going to focus on the thing that's actually happening, you know, which is all the other things that matter more uh, our conversation and our deeper thought. And we exclude all the things which are really like magical, amazing phenomenon but we just kind of ignore it so that we can focus on this i think that if if i could perceive what my avatar is is seeing in your root like in your off your through your computer screen or like you listening if i could perceive your reality via, via my then it would be more like an entanglement yeah but even even then i'm kind of seeing out of the screen at you through your camera true but I can't look around in your room, but I could, if it was a 3d camera, <laughs> um, I can't sense it other than sight and sound. Really. I can kind of feel the vibration of your voice. So we're measuring like, this based on what you can do in real life. You're like, okay, so in real life I can do more. Well, a lot of people can't. Like, so say you're in a wheelchair and you're in a small apartment and you get in a video game, all of a sudden you can do more. I think that's going to be also true of sensorial information. Like right now you can't see around my room. Very soon you will be. Right now, uh, you're able to, if you were in my room, you could do so many things. But very soon, with technology, you'll be able to do more than you would be able to do if you were actually in my room. Oh, I think yeah. that's... Fly. Like, fly. <laughs> like, be the, like, jacket. To be the painting. To be in, like, things, like, that are daydreamy and abstract. But also, maybe, like, you could, like, all of a sudden filter my room. Like what was the thing with the Casio Cortez and she farted and they're like, I don't know if she really farted. And they got like infrared footage and like, no, she farted. Like very soon, like you'll know more than you want to know <laughs> about people because of technology. Right. I guess deep fakes are going to be a big problem in those situations because they might've deep faked the infrared fart cloud on that girl. Yeah, I think they did, but it's, it, again, it doesn't matter. Like it's truth doesn't matter because that's what people experienced. Uh, it used to be that in real life you experienced things. So you'd ask them, was it true? But now people don't spirit they're inside all day. And so when they're on the internet, they're experiencing. So if it was untrue, it's more relevant because you experienced it more. I mean, right? I think that's true, like post truth. That's the postmodernist. Yeah, that, that's the concept is that the only truth is your perception. And I kind of, the concept of truth is interesting because it's like an agreed upon, people are like, no, it's real. Like you were saying, math existed before we got here, that concept is always, or, or like whatever geometry or whatever it's always been. But then if we don't like, okay, tell me all the things we don't perceive. Like you can't, cause we don't perceive them. It's, you, you, we haven't perceived them yet until we do, we can't tell you that they're, that they're real. And it would be a lie to say that they are. Um, but then as soon as we perceive it, it's true that they are. And so like, I don't see ever any objective truth. People are like, no, there is objective truth. And it's like, I don't, I, I don't think I, there's objective truth in material form. It's like the Tao, Lao Tzu says that the noble Tao, the noble truth, the noble way is not the eternal truth, the eternal way, the eternal Tao. It's not, it, you can have the, there is an eternal truth, sure, but it's not something that's material and material might echo it. But it won't last forever in that echoed form. That form is just, you know, um, you're like, oh, yeah, well, how is truth working today? Oh, well, today the way we do it is like if there's, you know, we we love thy neighbor. But like it might, it might, that those exact words might mean something very different in a thousand years. You know, I was just thinking about how um, if you butt dial someone or you get a booty call, like it, we're very, in a hundred years, no one's going to know the difference between those two terms. So the way we digest material form of data like it's the problem not that there are numbers because numbers really do prove themselves so i think consequentialism you know we can get to a point where we know the consequences of actions pretty well with science with technology with physics with experience 
Uh, and consequentialism is so much better than good and evil as like a rudimentary thing. Because rudi- good and evil, you're like, it's clearly coming from a lack of knowing that you're thinking that way. Whether something is evil to the world, evil to me, good for me, bad for you. What is this? Like consequences. If this happens, that happens. If we know that to a really broad extent, we're benefited by consequentialism. I think AI will help us with that. So consequentialism is the material form of truth. Uh, that that's a good way of looking at it, but the immaterial truth, or is there a better way to describe it than not material? I try not to use the word not, or I, I would prefer to use other words than the negative of a thing. To Maybe explain principles, something. principled truth or divine, uh, you know, like the thing is so many people will associate with spiritual, like it's divine truth, but I think maybe principles, like the principles of numbers, the principles of geometry or something like that. But I don't know. I mean, we might need a better word. If anyone's got a better word, I'm down. Yeah, this is the uh, step. Uh, well, the, 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 maybe there is. Maybe you're right that there is a, a, an immaterial truth that is before con- the consequentialism of matter. There is something going on that just is, and we are we're slowly discovering this thing that is. This is Stefan uh, Kalen with with the super chat with saying low key bum. This combo isn't you two in VR art gallery. Also, I like the way you spelled words. I do Dude. love Stefan. Stefan's base, and he's right. And we will we'll get the Oculus. We'll golf together. That'll be what we do. It'll be oh. great. Yeah, is it is it all set up? Can we do it? Like, is the technology available for us to it go? Is. Mark Zuckerberg and and Lex Friedman? It, it's it's not as perfect looking as that, I don't think. But it's like pretty good with just the regular two hundred dollar Oculus. Unless you have like the big expensive one, you can't do the perfect face like they did. But how the, do you? How big is the big expensive one? Which one is that? You it's know, like fifteen hundred or something like that. It's I would be medic- investing in something like that. To be honest, that sounds really uh, that would badass. be sweet. I would love one too. Oh. The MetaQuest Pro, oh, yeah, MetaQuest Pro, I think is the right one. Is that right? I'm gonna take your super chat down there, Stefan. That's a great one. The MetaQuest Pro. This is Meta. Thousand nine, bucks. Nine, nine. A thousand bucks. Yeah, I and mean, it's pretty Met, amazing. So how, but how does it know what I like when we're mapping it, and it looks like we're both in the room? How does it know what I look like? Is so it, it's got a it, camera on the other side that's recording your face. In in the thing, there's a camera. Yeah. Both directions. But, oh, it can it, record it your room. Whole... It can record your face, and it also maps your face onto a model of your face. And yeah. And it, then, are are we on cartoon bodies when we're golfing? Uh, in the cheaper version, yeah. But in this thing, I think you actually can look. I think that that was a big thing for them. They're like, no one likes that, and so they moved it to. If you really want, you can have the more realistic version. But like I said earlier, like. They had that technology for realistic people 20 years ago, 10 years ago, for sure. They just weren't releasing it portably. It wasn't possible to do it portably. And so they're trying to figure out how they can make this cheaper for as many people to get it as possible. And particularly kids, because they know they really just need to get kids into it. And then it'll be fine. Like as as soon as kids are adapted to this. And, you know, I hope at some point we talk with Peterson about this, because uh, looking at how AI is changing people's minds, cognitive uh, VR is changing people's net, like the non Euclidean geometry and everything. People get headaches when they grow up and they haven't used AI and they start using it. Children who've never used it before adapt to it. And everyone's all worried about that. And I don't know if we should be. I think actually kids raised in VR is going to end up being very useful to our future because they're going to be able to process the way we have depth perception. Parts of their brain is going to grow to be able to deal with non Euclidean geometry multiple profound depths that we're not aware of holographic depth perception so oh because in deep space we won't have depth perception that without like external uh points of reference there is no depth so Mm. it doesn't i mean i guess you still have your hand in front of your face so there is but even imagine if you're like in like a meta space like an ai like a dream like dmt trip oh in a dream yeah yeah how to control your dreams yeah and you might find that there's like 52 kinds of dimensionality or 10 dimensions at least and you know people say that but it's not something you can experience whereas math like computers can think and draw and articulate thousands of dimensions uh into a single shape in a way that we can only think of like a, a cube you know you can kind of imagine a cube in your mind imagine them with thousands of of angles and shapes so it can it can know that in a way that we can't and i think kids could learn to do that with just experiencing it we can experience things and learn it but we don't have it to experience in the real world so our brains haven't developed for that but we will wet wire evolve our parts of our brain will grow muscles will you know create new 
synapses if we if we have something to experience. I we just got a super chat from David Stig Hansen, who I'm a big fan of. He went to the Ricotte structure. Uh, David said, "I'm a new fan, and your guest is super smart." I agree. Andreas knows his stuff, man. David went to the Ricotte structure, the Eye of Mortania, wow. the purported uh, existence capital of Atlantis. He's been there twice as well. And uh, I, David, now that you're in the chat, uh, I, maybe you're still listening. Uh, I, he did a show with Jimmy Corsetti, you guys, David Stick Hansen and Jimmy Corsetti on Jimmy's Rumble channel, which you should go check out at uh, Bright Insight. And they went, he, uh, David was explaining, like he's done a lot of research on like satellite uh, imagery of the eye of the Sahara as well. And David, you said something about this, this like canal. Maybe we can at some point in the future have an episode where we go deeper on it. I'm, I'm looking it up right yeah, now. Yeah. I'm going to find you David online and let's do a show soon. Also I do uh, on my channel on exerted stuff. So I'll, I'd love to have you uh, come on and talk about your discoveries. Yeah. And I want to, so I'm going to pull this up and show the chat what I'm talking about while I present this and hopefully I'm on a, I'm on a new computer and I only have one monitor, so it's challenging to share screens in this situation right now. But here we go. You can see this, I think. Let me pull this down. Here we got Martani. Martani. This is the Eye of the Sahara with a topographical map. You see the white is the really, really high up mountains. Look at this. It looks like an animal. Like, ah, this is his mouth. Here's his mm. nose. These are all the mountains to the west of here's the Eye of the Sahara. You can see right here. This is purportedly the capital of Atlantis. There's these really high plateaus. And over here is where the tip the, the, the top of the plateaus are here, the, the the Atlantean plateaus before it just dropped into what used to be ocean. This is all sand now. The, the sand, the, the, the Sahara just blasted this whole environment with sand. But when you look at this, you can see ancient causeways that were built and carved. And here, look right here, for instance. Thanks for bearing with me with this weird mouse I've got. So this is like an old riverway that looks like it was dug. It's dug pretty straight. And then you see the, the river comes up here to the north to feed these people, which I like to call the bluffs of Atlantis. Once I get a better mouse, I'll, I'll do a, a more of a, a more in-depth. But look at this, dude. Look at this line right here. Okay, so they this line that goes, you see this one that's yellow mm. yeah. and red? So they came in and they dug this out uh, oh. at some point. I'm going to say, I don't know. Let me see if I can. Uh, first, I'll I get believe a satellite. It, though. Yeah, I'll get a that's satellite. That's a whole image. other thing, the Taman Reset River. You know, I'd like at some point. I was talking to David St uh, Stig Hansen about what he knows about the Taman Reset rivers systems and how the drought is associated. But yeah. So what it looks like, David, and David pointed this this out and was like, I think it was, I think you were uh, conceiving that it was like, why did they, why they dug it out, what it was for. Um, and you were saying some ideas. I think that they used it to go up the mountain, that they were maybe even had trolley cars. I don't know what their technology was like, but that this is how you got up onto the plateau. They would come in the river take this river up here to this carved thing that goes up to meet up with a riverway right here. And then they go up the rest of the way to the top of the plateau. And it was looking at the, uh, the topographical map that got me thinking that because the lowlands down here and then the upper, the highlands up here, and it just, it, it, it ends right at the, as the plateau begins. So thanks, David. Thanks for talking about this. Dude, that's this awesome. cause, yeah. This causeway here, the, the quad each wall. I'm not sure what that's what it is, but thank you for bringing that up with Jimmy. And that show is really great. I, again, I'd go check out Jimmy Corsetti and David Stig Hansen's show. There's a lot of good information in that. David, I just followed you on Twitter. Follow me back. Let's set up yeah. something. I'm really what interested now about the Taman Reset. He's like, I'm all over the Taman Reset. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is perfect. Dude, a special kind of human to like an adventurer at heart. Like that's yeah. really exciting. And I would love to go to the, the Eye of the Sahara someday. I got getting lit up just thinking about it. Well, you know, everyone keeps saying it's all dangerous, but I don't believe that. I'm sorry. And I'm, uh, I'm thinking about going. I'm thinking about going actually to, there's a bunch of these guys, you know, um, some Samir Osmanovich who did the Bosnian pyramids. He's going to uh, the pyramids um, pretty soon. And then what was the other one? Hartworth or something like that. I just did another video with somebody and they're going to do a pyramid thing. The guy who just discovered the uh, Nedra sky disc uh, connections. Um, Howard Crowhurst. Howard Crowhurst is a British guy who discovered. Have you seen the Nedra Sky Disc? No, what is it? Dude, look it up real quick. N E D R A, Nedra. And so it's this crazy thing. And the funny story is, and I got a whole long video. I was way longer than I expected. But the guy was saying that somebody stole it. The British were trying to prove that it was a forgery and they proved that it was real in the court case. So the guy wouldn't get arrested, essentially, was how they found this thing. And so they've been studying it. And it has every 
star system, the Pleiades, Venus, everything else across it. And this is one of these things that if you start using it every day and he shows how it can be used, you can figure out when you are, where you are and how things are going in the weather and in the future and in the past. It's got all these crazy little stars around it, the sun, the moon and the the wheel and everything like that. But yeah, it's it's image. it's kind of like connected to the Antica Mascara. Um, is that right? How you say that? You know, the Greek. There's you know, oh, the Antikethra, that ancient Antikethra machine right. they find at the at the bottom of the uh, the the Mediterranean. I literally just mixed it with Amida mascara, didn't I? That's hilarious. Amida yeah. muscaria, the mushroom. Yeah, I love yeah. It. Don't don't it's... don't do the sky disc with the mushroom at the same. So time. this is the, the, it's Nebra with a B as in boy. Nebra sky disc. Yeah. And what is it? Where that you said they found it? It's a bronze disc around thirty centimeters in diameter, weighs two point two kilograms, uh, and then it, it describes. This is like in how how old is it? This is oh, so the they think it's like three thousand years old. It's made out of crazy copper from like sixteen hundred BC. Um, and they were trying to some Germans have tried to prove that it wasn't real, but they've all failed at proving it's unreal. And it's made out of this really dated copper, which is why it's that color because the copper is so ancient that it started to oxidize so much that it's turned into this like beautiful, but like. When you look at it with laser scans and a scanning electron microscope, you can see like how old it really is. And yeah, so it's something that they found in Saxony, essentially. I mean, to think that they didn't have telescopes 10,000, 20,000 years ago, if they had circumnavigating the globe, I don't I don't know that they did, but it seems like Atlantis, maybe cultures what was it there was atlantis but I, anyway i would imagine they figured out how to curve glass and be able to get yeah you get it well you start with a crystal ball you start with a glass crystal ball and then you slice it right a slice of a crystal ball gives you a lens right so that's how they've been making lenses and that goes back forever and then you just use multiple lenses to, and yeah. mirrors to do you um who were these ancient cultures was atlantis the ancient athenians and then it was the mu yeah, so Lemuria, yeah, the Mu, right? The Mu is a important one. Um, part of the it gets really interesting, right? We've talked a bit about uh, expanding Earth theory, right? And I think uh, part of that is that people might not live today where they lived to start with. Things might have moved a lot, and people might have left the ori the original lands. That gets really, um. I don't want to say woo, but like a little bit more mystical because you're talking about Madame Blavatsky. But Madame Blavatsky was on a boat at the same time as Darwin, right? So when you start thinking about the connections in evolutionary theories in the 19th century, Blavatskyism is really, I think, centric to evolutionary theory. So the idea that these are also maybe different than the humans today, I mean, that's, that's basically one of the thoughts is that they were maybe taller or bigger or smarter or, or not. I love your screenplay that you've worked on because i remember reading parts of it where you kind of made a very humanized portrayal of atlantis that's very familiar with right now and i think you might be the closest in my own personal opinion i won't call it a hypothesis but just this idea that we romanticize like savoy zizek says that we will pretend that you know other cultures are better just because they're different or even if they're more primordial they're more i just think it's probable that they were a lot more like us and they got to a point where they let technology um take control they lost control and they you know they start flipping their soda machines yeah man i think you know i i'm kind of in the screenplay i'm working on which is absolutely fun as hell to, to build a screenplay about the lost city of atlantis is that like did they have radio i think maybe maybe if i had to guess i would say no but in my screenplay yes they do they did that's how they conquered the globe they had radio they were able to their ships knew what was coming before the other people's ships knew just a fun it makes perfect amount of sense because radio is something like you got to think about a, a culture that becomes so conscious they're biodegradable and they're wireless and that way when people go looking for it there's nothing to find of course what i got to figure out is how long did it take atlantis to flood when the comets hit the earth, was it three days? Did it happen in four hours? I've got to figure that out. And now I figured out that, 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 that tsunami that came East out of the Atlantic got, got blocked by the, the, the plateaued mountains to the North of the eye. Otherwise it would have been, the eye would have been completely buried and lost. So it was really happened that it, that we still have it available. Everything around it got hit by sand, except the plateau. I mean, it, it, it probably got smeared over, but then it just, the sand itself, for whatever reason, went to the North and the South of it. I, I just like played three the uh, days. Three days is good. Three days. I, I want to that. find out from the experts that could like Randall Carlson, maybe Jimmy knows more. I haven't talked to Jimmy Corsetti about it. Um, 
another uh, Graham Hancock knows a lot about it, but I want to like, how long would that have taken after those things hit for the entire, the entire place to go? Were you going to say something? Oh, I was, oh, I was just playing this in the background. It. Yeah. Where, yeah. What were you saying? This what is the expanding earth theory that that's twisting open. So you can see how like South America fits plugs in exactly to Africa and it's just twisting open. And a lot of these stretch marks on Google maps in the ocean, I'll pull up the stretch marks as you're talking. And you can imagine like 12 hours, it, 12 hours it took, I think for like uh, the tsunami in Japan to reach California in 2010. Right. So that's a pretty long period of time already. And so you can imagine like if there are volcanoes that are connected to some seismic action that you would hear about it for a day before it reached you, if you're on an Island and it, then when it's happening, it probably wouldn't stop happening for quite some time. Like a tsunami is something that keeps going. So it could just go for four hours, but then that wouldn't necessarily be the kind of cataclysm that we're talking about. If this is a tsunami that goes on for days, that kind of makes sense. That it's all of a sudden, eventually also, if this is built on top of a place that sinks because of tectonic plates opening or uh, seismic activity, like if it's on top of a volcano that erupted itself, that's the thing. If Atlantis was built on top of a, a dormant volcano, or something then yeah we'd be it could be that it just literally opened up fell into the sea water seeped in because uh submarine volcanoes create islands and they also dissipate soil and lose that like every day hundreds of islands appear and disappear we don't have an actual count of the amount of islands in polynesia there's a new bigger islands emerging in japan i mean we just don't understand like how the world works it's like it's like a kid with zits <laughs> Someone was saying, I think I read this comment on Twitter this morning or something, that the uh, the eye of the Sahara, the actual bubble of the three ringed city, um, could have been caused by an underwater or an underground water geyser, and the, not magma. It wasn't actually volcanic; it was water, and that would make a lot of. And it tried to erupt, but got couldn't get through the surface, so it caused gigantic ripples and caused the, the land of that around it to elevate. Jimmy Corsetti yeah. actually just posted um, an image of a similar structure on Mars, like similar three ring with right. plateaus all around it. And that would make sense because it, it, in that they said that Atlantis had like uh, freshwater geysers in the middle on the middle Island. They had saltwater geyser and a freshwater geyser where they had access to it. This is what I was going to pull up here on uh, Google maps is the stretch marks, earth's stretch marks. If earth is actually expanding, which I think it is twisting open. I mean, come on South America fitting into Africa is about as does it gets. Look at these. These are stretch marks as it's tearing open. And then my guess is that hydrogen is spewing out and it's mixing with the oxygen to produce water, which is where all this ocean water is coming from. Right. I don't think it was just a geyser. I think that a big part of what submarine volcanoes are produce geysers, but a geyser is, you know, usually like a kind of a pressurized spring, which is caused often by volcanic activity anyway. But this is in the ocean. So what I think it is, is a submarine volcano actually produced enough. Um, it produced enough land underneath this island that it rose up and that there was a space perhaps that solidified. And as water got into there, pressure started to build, which is basically what a geyser is. But the geyser is being produced and not able to release because it's underneath the landmass. And it's being constantly filled with more heat from a submarine volcano which is also making the space bigger around it. So it's holding more and more pressure until eventually it explodes. That's essentially what happened in Krakatoa. Um, that's what happened in Campi Fiegri. There's a number of examples. St. Helens is very similar to this, although it was not in the water. But there are, if you start looking into submarine volcanoes, 80, 90% of volcanoes are underwater. And so we okay. don't even recognize it. So this could, um, I got Atlantis here up on the screen. <laughs> I'm going to call it Atlantis. I don't know anyone else wants to challenge that. I'd be happy to debate it. Um, this is like, this kind of was misleading to me for a long time because I thought this was lower than what's up here to the north. Hmm. Um, it turns out this is, oh, geez, can I get, oh, man. I think this is, this itself is the plateau. See this, now I'm going to go back to, uh, to the colored map, the topographic map, because this is how you get the real deal. Uh, where are we at? Oh, look at the man. It, so I, I have the reference because I've been studying this for so long. But these islands here, here's the eye of the Sahara up here to the northeast. Um, and then so here's all the mountains. It's like the mountains got cracked, got pushed up with it. So you think this was all underwater and that it all got pressed up like all this, this plateau area just got pressed up above. And then because this was all still underwater here and down here was underwater. But this area was elevated. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that it's, it could be easily explained with a submarine volcano that's producing more uh, earth, more sediment that's being pushed from underneath it and more magma that's pushing it upwards. Um, there's a lot else that's going on here that seems like slightly different today than it would have been if we're covering Herodotus's idea of Atlantis, that if this was all surrounded in water, that makes more sense. Um, but then that also isn't impossible because we could be talking about dropping sea levels too. Like if sea levels drop because um, salt water is then freed, pressure is then causing the salt to become a, slingle, a singular uh, sedimentary layer, fresh water is developing, fresh water is then freezing, frozen fresh water is then not able to go back into the sea. We've got a lot of frozen fresh water that's been filtered from saline water that happened into glacial periods. And it's a big thing that volcanoes seem to lead to cold periods. You know, the year without a summer is caused by a volcano where there's a volcano that goes off in Iceland. And afterwards in the 1800s, 1815, 16, there's no spring. There's no summer because the seasons are actually screwed up water flowing in different directions, completely cut off in other uh, circumstances, changes the clouds and everything. So again, with feedback loops, like the most important thing is feedback loops change really rapidly uh, when there's a ecological devastation like a volcano. Volcanoes are the most interesting thing. And people who often see there are stories of comets, a lot of comets that are actually just ejections from volcanoes coming out like guns into the sky. Not all of them, but there are uh, circumstances like that. So people could get rain, uh, an entire town could get destroyed be, like miles and miles away because there's like a, a mountaintop that's pressurized and all of a sudden shoots out and then it lands literally miles away. Right. Do you think we, I, we talked about this a little bit, I think when we were in Chile, cause Chile is a country that has a lot of money and resource well, relatively, but they don't have a lot of land mass. And I was like, well, what if we sieved the volcanoes or sieved the volcanoes and then flowed the magma into the ocean to create new shoreline? And uh, it would just hit the water, cool down, make more rock, and then we could populate and expand outward, our continents outward. Do you think that that is technically feasible? So anything's feasible. I've come to that tenant that anything's feasible. There, there's all kinds of problems with e ecological feedback loops. If you were to change the coastline right now, California and Chile are mirror image to each other, essentially. It's like they were ripped apart somehow, and then you just see the same coastline. I can go down to Chile and find similar bays to Monterey. You know, I can find things like that. And if you go further north, I can go to Alaska, and I'll find very similar places to Ushuaia. So I think that if you were to block, if all of a sudden there was a big amount of landmass here, the first thing that would happen is it would stop water from flowing from the Gulf into the Gulf of Mexico and it would change the flow, would change fishing, change how turtles work, et cetera. The other thing is eventually that would not work because water does what it does. Water is one of the most powerful forces. So it would probably break that if you had this giant land thing sticking out, go around it and it would start to make, um, you know, the, the waves would crash against the rock until eventually, unless we really just demanded that this would be the way nature would push uh, through there again. And you'd end up like so, you have with California, the Channel Islands. The Channel Islands were once a peninsula and then they're broken off. So like you'd have to calculate uh, geometrically how water erodes systems and build in like pre-built riverways and, and like methods for the water to decompress and pass through without just smashing up the new land. Yeah, but like again, things just change, and so it could be also that nature just does that on its own. But we we got to be careful, right? Like if you were to take the rainforest, at one point we we're talking about how if we move the rainforest out of South America because we could put a bunch of cities in Brazil, and that's not our idea. That's what they're doing. They're destroying the rainforest. It's nearly gone. But Ian's like, hey, we could put the whole rainforest on boats in the middle of the ocean, you know, and then we'd have a rainforest. It's true. The problem is. What does that do in the middle of the ocean? Where does that oxygen go? How much methane is it eating? And so what we're finding is it actually makes more sense to try to like build our cities into uh, place forests because those trees are eating the carbon monoxide for us, right? So we're better off trying to integrate into nature than to try to separate it somewhere else. And so that leads us back to, again, ecological feedback loops. The future is a thing called technogionism. And that's like, we're looking at the whole world. We're looking at how resources flow and we're figuring out 
what's the most logical way that that can happen? That'll lead to gliders that follow the wind currents and then seeds being dropped, right? We'll eventually mix technology with nature to such a point that it becomes this fully sustainable system. That's the ideal solution. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I keep waiting for Ben Peterson to make a, 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 a miraculous entrance. I don't know if you're listening, Ben, I doubt it, but um, this is actually spec. This show turned out to be, you know, flipping awesome in my opinion. I do love when we do shows, bro. We should definitely Dude, do it again soon. Two and a half hours. It was the longest show yet. And with the largest view count I think I've ever had on a live show. Of course, there's a phenomenon that it's constantly growing as it goes, but that's pretty badass. I think the content was was nice, was awesome. Dude. Um, so Ben Peterson is in the thumbnail. Ben is uh, I don't know if he's a, I wouldn't call him a scientist. He's in the defense sector and has all just a really, really smart, connected guy that knows a lot a, a lot about a lot of stuff. And one day we'll get him on probably the next time, but I'll probably end up changing the thumbnail to represent that it was me and you and that Ben didn't never show unless you're listening, Ben, and you're going to pop in here and make magic. Uh, Andreas Nicholas Exertus. Uh, yo, bro, anything you thinking before we, we wrap it? Uh, just, Honestly. yeah, let's, let's do this again, dude. This is great. And uh, if it's cool, I'd like to share this with my discord and people and like reswap stream it and stuff like that. Please do. There. Yeah. We got to yeah. get these VR helms too. Cause that was, Let's Step get on that. Sweet. I'm, knowledge. I got the PSVR two, but uh, so if you get a PSVR two, you can do it. Otherwise, we'll go we'll go Oculus and we can go hardcore. That's I'm like thinking Oculus. Is it like uh, is it uh, wireless? Yeah. Oh, uh, you have just... a thing you have to wear on your pocket, I think. But no, it's that's the, yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah, it is. All right, man. And for everyone <laughs> listening and watching, uh, thank you guys for coming and having a good time and staying and chatting and everything. It was really fun. Subscribe to the channel, follow Exertus. Uh, there's a link if you're from wherever you're looking, you can get a link to his stuff in the description or, you know, it's at Exertus, X-I-R-T-U-S on YouTube and elsewhere. I think well, pretty much all over the internet that has been uh, co-opted by the man. <laughs> and, um, subscribe and we'll, uh, we'll catch you next time. See you later. Yeah.